There's a pervasive fog of negative sentiment out there. When every single headline is negative, it's time to buy. I still think the dollar is going to be king in this sort of environment. So the earnings are super powerful and stocks are cheap at this point. The bond in the stock market are trading as one. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen. Thrilled you are with us from the World Economic Forum meetings in a very different Davos, Switzerland. We're going to get right to it. A great set of guests coming up. Lisa will tell you about that. But we need to set the stage in May of what always occurs in January. I'm stunned how jarring it is. I did not expect it to be so odd this year. Well, not only is it not snowing and it's not freezing, but definitely the quiet tone to the meetings, somber, people somber. somber. And I yeah. think that that's appropriate. And when we're just coming mm. off the worst uh, route or the longest stretch of uh, declines on the S&P and the NASDAQ going back to 2001 for the Dow to 1923, although evidently nobody looks at it if John were here. How do you then spin forward a narrative of optimism amid such deafening pessimism right John Farrell on assignment, Capri, the World Economic Forum meetings <laughs> where there's no wind. We've got a really nice hurricane here like Hurricane Petra of a couple years ago in Switzerland. We're going to put up with the wind and also look at the winds of change in this economy. Klaus Schwab's front page of the World Economic Forum, Lisa, by far the most serious somber I've ever seen. How can they project optimism when we possibly are facing a downturn? We did see that the head of the IMF came out and said she does not see recession as inevitable. President Biden uh, sounding right. a similar tone. How much is this just the inevitable optimism they have to portray rather than something that is true, uh, especially given the sort of high food prices and the inflation that really is crippling the middle class? At 12 noon with the bells of the church behind us up this valley. It's a smaller audience than normal but not that much smaller. I would point out the first observation of this Davos is it's definitely less corporate. There's less visible branding of the modern Davos. It's much more like a 2008 or even earlier than that Davos. And the, behind that is market stability today. Let's go through the data real quickly here. Green on the screen yields up about three basis points. Uh, some, even the dollar comes in a little bit. Yeah, and what we see is actually euro strength today, especially as ECB president. Yeah, uh, Christine Lagarde coming out and seeing <clears throat> positive rates or the end of negative rates, I should say, by the end of September, really pushing forward this idea of trying to tighten right. into uh, what they see as huge inflationary pressures. We're going to speak to a whole host of amazing people uh, today, including Jason Fermer, who's a Furman, who is a professor at Harvard. We're also going to be uh, speaking with Ricardo Hausman, who is uh, also of Harvard, but could have been president of Venezuela. He'll have a fascinating view. Or could view. one day be president yeah, of Venezuela. Exactly. The founder of this phrase, original sin. There's a lot to talk about there on the economics of the moment. Yeah, we're also going to be speaking with Rebecca Patterson, uh, chief investment strategist at Bridgewater, how they see possibly more pain in big tech uh, with yields possibly climbing to 4% on the 10-year. And John Kerry, U.S. Special Climate Envoy and former U.S. Secretary of State, joining us at a pivotal moment for him. And frankly, uh, as you have pointed out, Tom, for the Democratic Party as well, especially uh, given some of the walk back we heard this morning from yeah. the White House. I was with Senator Kerry and I, he will always be for me the senator from Massachusetts, but I was with John Kerry at the last real Davos with Bank of America, and he was prodigious on global warming. And one of the themes here, they really don't want to talk about it, but with Newcastle Coal in Australia to the moon, Global warming has taken a back seat. Climate change. <laughs> How do you then parlay right. some kind of ESG agenda at a moment where suddenly getting as much oil and gas as possible is what's in vogue? Over the next four days, we're going to do a lot on economics, on international relations, but we cannot ignore the market turmoil. We start strong with Margit Patel, senior portfolio manager, Offspring Global Investments, who has seen this before. Margie, thank you so much for joining us on short notice. What is different this time about a record pullback in bonds, price down, yield up? Yes, that's right. Uh, and actually, there hasn't been any place to hide as far as a safe haven. If you look at corporate bonds, investment grade, junk bonds, even treasuries, everything is down about 10 to 12 percent total rate of return. So almost to some of the better equity sectors. So it's really been no place to hide so far. How do you get optimism amid the stomach-churning volatility that you have been seeing, Margie? 
Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think what's happened is the Fed, having been sort of comatose when, when rates were low, the danger signals are starting, has now talked very, very tough about aggressively raising rates, aggressively selling down their portfolio, and it's really scared the market to death. They've only made 75 basis points of rate increases in the short end. But if you look along the curve, uh, bonds are up in, in yield 120 to 150 or 60 basis points. So the market has raced ahead of the Fed. It's anticipating the Fed to be very aggressive in their action. That's starting to roll over into the real economy and certainly into the equity market. Margie, there is a belief in markets that is pervasive that the Fed will step in at some point, that they will take notice of the carnage in, oh, uh, in some of these equities and they will actually uh, stop some of their hiking. You are one of those people who does believe that, but we have seen no signs of it. What gives you such confidence on that front? I think reality will, will um, awaken them. I think they've been maybe a little bit too attuned to Wall Street saying we need much higher rates and ignoring what's going on in the real economy as far as consumer inflation, signs that we're actually seeing employment start to roll over. And uh, those are worrying signs, and I think the Fed will see them. Typically, they lag the reality, the market, but hopefully they will see that they're beginning to do damage to the real economy, which is in pretty good shape. Uh, the excesses have really been in the zero interest rate part of the market, the equity market, mm -hmm. the housing market, other real asset markets. Margie, I want to talk about coupon right now. The coupon has changed. The yield of maturity has changed. For our audience on radio and TV, what they're gambling on is I'm getting a higher yield now, no question about that, but I'm worried about price decline. How do you balance the greed of grabbing that higher yield versus the fear of bonds continuing south? Well, I think we're very near the uh, peak in interest rates, frankly, because of the, I think the econ economic centers are going to be getting to roll over and the Fed will stop what they're doing. Uh, and really, when you look at high yield bonds yielding six and a half to eight and a half percent, trading at 90 cents on the dollar for a longer term investor, meaning a year or more, that looks like a pretty reasonable risk return alternative. Frankly, it may do as well as the equity market, which we think will just be mid single digit to low double digit. So to be clear here, and let's be clear, Margie Patel has claimed worldwide, folks, for a truly balanced outlook on equities and bonds. Did I just hear you say bigger appetite for yield and longer duration yield versus buying a dividend growth story? Uh, well, I think there's always going to be more money to be made in equities over the long term. But over the, say, the next year or so, especially if you're interested in income, not capital appreciation, uh, corporate bonds, especially high yield, I think are really pretty attractive on a risk reward basis. Margie, what do you have to see in order to actually achieve this in terms of a downturn? A lot of people baking in a recession. We are seeing that certainly baked into a lot of valuations. You're basically suggesting that's off the table and high yield is still the place to hide. Well, I'm assuming that is a big risk that the Fed doesn't get the markets, the real economy signals, and keep marching along with a very aggressive tightening program. But if they look at the real world out there, I think they'll see it's time to take a big pause. And I think at that point, we will more or less um, evaluate the market and perhaps be able to see a way through without a recession. If the Fed keeps doing what they're doing, we may very well have a recession at the end of this year or in 23, uh, precipitated by their actions, as well as global weakening. There's a lot of negative things going around in the world away from the U.S. that could really drag the U.S. market down from here. So I hope the Fed will uh, look around uh, before they uh, get too aggressive. Margie, why haven't we seen more substantial outflows, in particular uh, from bonds? We have seen some, but why hasn't there been a stampede away from an instrument that should be full faith in credit and should be rock solid? I think one of the reasons is because if you look at the yield on money markets, it's still very, very low. So it really isn't a competitive place to hide. It's not as if you could get three or four percent in money markets and say, fine, I'll stay there. Uh, you're still looking at at best something maybe approaching 25 basis points. So I think people are inclined to say we've seen this volatility before. We're going to stay where we are. Or those people who have gotten obliterated in some of those equity names that have blown up uh, or maybe uh, don't have anything left to sell or just sort of froze and not sure what to do in this market. 
Margie Patel, thank you so much for getting us started here in Davos. Margie Patel, of course, of Allspring Global Investments. And Lisa, what is so important here and so far unspoken is all the muckety mucks up Happy Valley are linked in to long term Margie Patel like institutional money. And frankly, in the bond space, it's worse than 2009 right now. Right. I can't believe I'm saying that, <laughs> folks, but it is. Well, and that's actually what Rick Reeder of BlackRock said. Uh, there was a Wall Street Journal article, and he was quoted as saying his stomach is churning and that these are some of the worst price well, swings and most volatility that he has seen in his 30-year career. And a lot of people pushed back and said, what about 2020 in March? What about 2009 yeah. and 2008? And the reality is, Tom, this is unheard of. The 60-40 has gotten decimated the worst year ever so far for this type of portfolio. Right. How do you readjust? My stomach's turning, too, after the third bowl of barley soup, <laughs> yeah. which is great. Thank yeah. you, Hotel Parsons, for the best food going. You've got to explain <laughs> to our listeners, and this, I mean, this is an American thing. The American fixation two decades ago of Heidi Abramowitz, Girl of the Alps, was extraordinary. <laughs> explain the fixation to our international audience of the Heidi of like I'm 30, so glad. 20, 30 years I'm ago. I'm so glad that we have less than a minute for this. Yes, yes. I was obsessed with you Heidi. Were obsessed I read with it. Heidi. It was the first chapter book that I read, and the hills are alive with the sound of music and the flowers, and it's beautiful, and stay happily over there with the bell around its neck. <laughs> and you hear it, it's right, it's beautiful. <laughs> I, and you know what? I'm not doing this again. And Heidi <laughs> ended up in Zurich and went goth, right? Yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, hi, Ed. Here's what we're going to do we're going to keep the markets abreast. Rebecca Patterson to join us later from Bridgewater. That'll be important. But we began to look at the new theory of Davos amid the fears in economics and particularly the market turmoil. We need a course in EC10 getting us started here at the World Economic Forum on the themes of the moment. Jason Furman joins us from Harvard. Please stay with us from the World Economic Forum. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word on Rishka Gupta. The White House is now walking back President Biden's comments on Taiwan in Tokyo. The president said the U.S. military would intervene to defend Taiwan in any attack from China. That appeared to break the longstanding U.S. policy of so-called strategic ambiguity. The White House later said the president simply meant the U.S. would provide military equipment to Taiwan, not sending troops. And the Biden administration announced that a dozen Indo-Pacific countries will join the U.S. in a sweeping economic initiative. The goal is to counter China's influence in the region. Australia, India, Japan, South Korea and New Zealand are included, along with seven Southeast Asian countries. But the new framework doesn't include any tariff reductions, and it's unclear which parts are binding. In Australia, the Labour Party's Anthony Albanese is, has been sworn in as Prime Minister. He defeated former Prime Minister Scott Morrison in an election held on Saturday. He's promising swift action on climate change, greater gender equality and improved wage growth. And British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is preparing for another dressing down over illegal parties in Downing Street. Civil servant Sue Gray is expected to publish her internal investigation to the details of the so-called Partygate scandal this week. It may include potentially damaging photographs. Johnson has committed to making a statement in Parliament on the matter. Bloomberg's learned that chipmaker Broadcom is in talks to acquire cloud computing company VMware in what would be a massive deal. VMware currently has a market valuation of about $40 billion. An acquisition will put Broadcom into a highly specialized area of software. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Richard Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Is a recession in the United States inevitable? No. Why not? Our GDP is going to grow faster than China's for the first time in 40 years. Now, does that mean we don't have problems? We do. We have problems that the rest of the world has, but less consequential than the rest of the world has them because of our internal growth and strength. The president of the United States saying, no, we're not going to have a recession. No, you, you why would, off your no. Chair. Okay, so he's saying it's not inevitable. What, what else is he going to say? What else is what he going to say? Say? Yes. say? Yeah, it's inevitable. We're just doomed, you the know? The president on a successful reset in the Pacific Rim, we thank Robert Hormatz, who was just 
wonderful about a week ago, giving us perspective on our fractured Pacific Rim relationships. And the president is over there trying to begin, just begin to piece it back uh, together. We welcome all of you in May and Davos, not January. It is spectacular. I vote immediately they should move the meetings to June. I think that a lot third, of people third, would. Third week, fourth week of June. Sundress. Sounds good it's to lovely. me. Let's get started now at these World Economic Forum meetings with someone who can synthesize it together. Jason Furman, he's professor at Harvard Kennedy School, former chairman of the U.S. Council of Economic Advisors. What he does more than anyone in this nation is stand up in front of bright cherubs and teach them their first course in economics at Harvard. He is the one who has followed on from Mankiw and Martin Feldstein to deliver what's called Ec-10. What did you say in the first week of May to the eager students who've never seen a bond market like this and never seen the second derivative moves that we're seeing in markets as it relates to our economy? Well, to my students, I told them that when the price goes down, the yield goes up. <laughs> Good. <laughs> we have an opening, well. right? We need, we, where do we need somebody tired? <laughs> um, I think your viewers are probably on top of that one already. Um, what I'm not sure your viewers are on top of is that I think this inflation is going to be pretty persistent, not where it is now, but way above where the Fed wants it gonna be, to be. That means the Fed's going to need to stay at it, a Fed funds rate of 4% or higher, completely plausible, not at all priced into the market right now. Because a lot of people, like Marky e. Patel, who was just on, believes that the Federal Reserve will come out and they will rescue the markets. And you're saying, no way. Why? Because we are way above our inflation target. That is the job the Fed was assigned. You have a chair who talks about himself in the sort of wake of Paul Volcker and that historical shadow, he wants to bring that inflation down. Right now, the market is helping him do his job. I think this is not an accident. This is almost something that they are fine with. We were laughing. We shouldn't have been laughing completely because the prospect of a recession is horrendous. Do you think it's avoidable, as Joe Biden said, or do you think the Fed, frankly, has to essentially allow that to happen to cool the inflation as it is? You know, over the next year, I'm not that worried. I mean, I'm always at 15% for a recession. Maybe I'm at 20% now for the next year, but not much higher. Consumers are still spending a lot. There's people coming off the sidelines for jobs. There's more inventory rebuilding to be done. When you look after this year, that's when I get more worried. That's when more of the yeah. Fed rate hikes start to kick in and affecting the economy. Jason, the punditry out there right now, I've never seen. It's worse than 2009. Those pundits are silent when they listen to you. Within the geometry of where we are, when we get interest rates to slam like they are, when you give us the fear of a terminal rate to 4%, how does that link in to the actuarial assumption of bonds and separately the total return of equities? Yeah, I think that the long bonds haven't fully priced in that, you know, they think the Fed's gonna stop at 3%. That might happen. We might hit a recession and they go back to zero, but that we could be at four, well above four. I think that's the modal scenario. I, when you look at something like the long yields, those just okay. haven't gone up the same way they have on the front end Let's of the curve. Let's go up Benjamin Friedman, the giant of Harvard economics. Let's look back to the Napoleonic Wars or the Panic of 1870, the gyrations out of World War I, a fractured Europe and all. That's the arch fear that's out there for truly a generation or two that have not enjoyed what we're in right now. What does it do to a portfolio? What does it do to a pension fund? Yeah, I mean, that interest rate shows up in every single stock price as on the discount factor. That's why, you know, almost every single stock price is going down right now. Are you in the, the triple story... leveraged all cash fund? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you, trying to, you trying to pitch that? Is that what you're going? No, I, I just, well, they want me to start. A, they want me to start either an ETF or an NFT. I'm sure. I can't remember ETF which. NFT. I can imagine Jason, with your face on it. The fear, NFTs. Here, the fear here, Jason, is if we get a further first and second derivative move that we've all enjoyed for four months that we're gonna get a true negative 35% Dow. We're gonna get bonds like we've never, never seen back to say the 30s. Do you ascribe to that? I think that's a possibility. Look, I, I focus more on the real economy. 
I look at households that have $2.3 trillion still saved up from all the transfers they got over the last two years. I look at businesses who still are facing pretty good financing if they want to make more investments. I look at you know, a global environment where the dollar strength is you know, worrying me and the downdraft we're getting on net exports. So I'm looking at those factors overall. You know, I think we're going to see a lot of jobs this year. So there are some people who believe that the more we see a momentum and a lack of recession now, the worse it will be later. And they point to people levering up on the consumer side once again in order to fuel their purchases even at higher prices. Do you agree? I think that's possible. I, it really depends. You know, the Fed thinks inflation's coming down to 2.5%. If that happens, and there's sort of a 25% chance it happens, that'll be wonderful. We can avoid all these things. If inflation stays stuck at right. four and a half, five percent and that's roughly where the underlying mm -hmm. inflation rate is right now, um, I, I don't know mm -hmm. what sort of pain you'd need if you want to bring it back down. One minute. Long ago and far away, a Columbia professor saw a kid at Harvard, and he said, this kid's different. He's going to work with me. How dead on was your mentor, Joe Stiglitz, on globalization and his discontents? It's no. shocking. I saw Joe. Uh, Joe. Joe doesn't love globalization, but uh, Joe likes it here in Davos. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, I, I think, I think we're, we're seeing a pause in globalization. I think we're seeing a plateau. Don't think we're going to see that bigger right. retrenchment because there are so many efficiency gains from operating all over the world. We'll see some recalibration. See? But I don't think there's going to be a big withdrawal from it, it, and I don't think there should be. And the agreement that we have, folks, just so you understand this, is I get to choose one guest. So we have the optimism of Jason Furman, <laughs> and you chose Stiglitz that we have in the next hour. Yeah, Stiglitz right? will be coming up, and he'll yeah, be we'll uh, countering. We'll say, some gloom we, as said, well. we heard that you like globalization here at Davos. That was what Jason <laughs> Furman told us, and we'll see what he responds. Don't get me in trouble. Professor Furman. <laughs> Thank you so much for Act 10 to get us started here uh, in uh, Davos. What are the markets doing? The markets, no well, we had a little bit of a lift. I thought your and... people talked to you and, <laughs> and told you what we're doing. I'll say, Here's look, we're all seeing right now. Today. The S&P is now 39.24, up yeah. 25. So you Chill do have down. a little bit of a lift. A little bit, perhaps, people trying to take a breath after the longest streak of losses going back. Yeah, I think that's 2001. nicely said. Ten-year yield, 2.82. Uh, percent. We've got so much more coming up. Rebecca Patterson to be with us. And also, I'm really looking forward to this. Dr. Thin Wing Thin of Brown Brothers Harriman will join us on Mr. Biden's Pacific Rim. Stay with us from Davos. Good morning. On radio, on television. Good morning, everyone, from the meetings of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, as we've said many times, so, so different this year. Much talk, of course, of the war in Ukraine and much talk about deglobalization. Lisa Bramwitz at with me, John Farrow on assignment in Capri. Help me with this word deglobalization. How do you translate that? Right now, you're seeing the greatest number of mentions of deglobalizations in more than a decade. If you look at some of the transcripts of companies and basically they're right. coming out and trying to not just deglobalize, but change where they have their supply chains, make them more local, just-in-time delivery is so important at a time when there's resilient. just is too much more money. Like your hairspray is resilient. <laughs> My hairspray is not resilient for the FUM. We didn't even go to the FUM, which is the, the incredible, food. yeah, he does an incredible the Swiss win. It's a FUM. <laughs> oh, dear Lord. Honestly, I think that this is going to be one of the key questions. Yeah. How do you rearrange supply chains in a world where suddenly we are more dependent than ever on one another? What happens if suddenly we can't get chips from Taiwan? Know, All of a sudden, well, those iPhones become there it is. a lot more the challenging. The chips are front and center, but it's way more than chips, as the yes. president knows, on a swing through northern uh, Asia. Right now, we're going to rip up the script, and we're honored to do this with Win Thin. Dr. Thin is global head of currency strategy at Brown Brothers Harriman. But far more than that, from his native Burma, he is someone just viscerally entwined, with a, uh, entwined, I should say, with the Pacific uh, Rim. Win Thin, thank you so much for joining. Robert D. Kaplan talks about the South China Sea, and he walks around it in a circle, chapter by chapter, and he talks of the change there in China. What does President Biden need to do economically? What does President Biden need to do politically to restore America's relationship with the Pacific Rim? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me. It's, it's always a pleasure to be here with you, with, uh, with you two, and also Jonathan. 
Um, I, I will say this. We, you know, we had a, a, a bunch of comments out of uh, President Biden uh, today, and many, many of them centered on, on China. Obviously, the most important thing is this new uh, Asian partnership that he announced. Uh, in a sense, it's, China's been on the back burner really since Mr. Biden came in, and, and rightfully so. He's had to struggle with the t fight with the, the pandemic and struggle with the recovery. But China seems to be circling back onto the front burner. Um, so this, uh, this new partnership uh, with, uh, I think, I believe 10 nations in Asia, I think to me is sort of a pivot back to sort of the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, that was torn up, I think, by the previous administration. Uh, and it's a way to well, sort of reassert uh, the U.S., uh, interest in the in the region, uh, and again, it's a, it's a pretty big signal to China that hey, you know, we're still keeping an eye on you. Uh, we are still hoping to sort of uh, provide a counterweight to your um, uh, influence in the region. And so, I think it's a big deal. I think obviously the the details have to to, to be uh, worked out still, but I think it's a big statement from President Biden. Okay. When I read it, came in, I read a bunch of headlines. The first headline being that President Biden actually came out and said that the U.S. would defend Taiwan. A lot of people view this as a complete upheaval of his position. It was walked back subsequently. Uh, and then he talked about possibly or his administration removing some of the tariffs on China. That seems to be what has been driving the U.N. gaining today versus the dollar and some of the optimism that we're seeing. Not as much, perhaps, the arrangement that we really don't know many details about. How do you view the idea of the removal of Trump era tariffs. Well, it's it's, it's certainly eye opening. Uh, it's something that they, that I think has been um, quietly, uh, I guess, dissuaded in the past. But obviously, we're in this new normal where inflation is much higher than than, than anyone expected, and so it's, officials are looking for ways to to ease the pain for the U.S. consumers. So, to me, it, it's always been a, a sort of a, a nice uh, point of leverage that was gifted to President Biden. That is. President Trump uh, imposed the tariffs. He you know, took this very tough line against China um, and it, it sort of handed these tariffs over to the U.S. And it's always been, I think, a good uh, point of leverage for the U.S. to, to maintain. So my guess would be if, if they are discussing some sort of a relief tariff, it would be on a temporary basis. That is, I don't think the U.S. policymakers want to give up that point of leverage. They'll, may, they may have a maybe six-month window, maybe a bit, a bit more given you know, how the supply chains are. So I, I, I don't think it's going to be something like all of a sudden everyone's buddy-buddy again. I do think that, uh, that the, the U.S.-China relationship remains contentious and will remain contentious uh, going forward. Uh, in terms of the yuan gains, I think a lot of it's just driven by wider dollar uh, uh, sell-off, dollar weakness. Uh, it's, it's down against pretty much every major currency and every emerging market currency today. And I think it's sort of the, the pendulum of sentiment, as you know, the FX market, the pendulum of sentiment you know, swings very wildly. And right now it's swinging sort of anti well, I won't say anti, but it's sort of, uh, I guess, uh, risks of U.S. Uh, recession uh, are being priced in. It's sort of a less uh, hawkish Fed. So, again, I think this pendulum will swing back eventually. But for now, I think the dollar's on its back foot. So when the pendulum of doom that has been really pervasive has shifted a little bit to the pendulum of something that is a little bit different, at least for the past couple of trading sessions. But when when you talk to clients, can they get any conviction around the U.N. about going back into China after massive outflows, given this contentious relationship of which you speak? Yes. I mean, the whole China story has been complicated, not just by the economics, but by the politics. Uh, as, as you know, the, the COVID zero has, has wreaked havoc on the Chinese economy. I think it's going to be impossible for them to meet their 5.5% or about 5.5% growth target for this year. So from a fundamental story, uh, it's hard to, to argue for going back into China at this point. And politically, while they're still cracking down on tech companies, there's this sort of shared prosperity uh, theme that uh, President Xi is, is pushing. So to me, there's a lot of reasons to stay out of China, at least for now. I know there's some smart people out there who are trying to to pick right. the bottom, but I think I think it's very dangerous right now. I think interesting you know, again, given how this this sort of the, the U.S. China relationship is back yeah. back in the headlines, it's it's, it's going to make me, I think investors very uneasy. When I was talking with our Simon Kennedy about the linkage here of markets and all we're talking about in Davos, and particularly in the great economic call, and as you know, the global litmus paper is the dollar and the dollar system, the floating rate system that we have. Can we have market stability with a resilient dollar, or does it destabilize so many emerging markets? Does it destabilize flows so much that we're just not going to get to a solid market outcome without weak dollar? Well, Tom, that's a great question, because as you probably know, there's been some chatter in, in the last week or two about some sort of uh, plaza accord. Um, 
to to uh, help weaken the dollar. Now, I think to me, in effect, a lot of it's really about the pace as opposed to level. And you know, it's the if pace is if the pace is very fast, that's where the risk of destabilizing uh, moves happen. To me, right. if you look back to nineteen you know mid eighties, you know, we had a dollar move of somewhere around 30, 40, 45 percent, and we're nowhere near close to that at, at this point. So. Uh, you know, it's something I think, Tom, that needs to be monitored, but I don't think it's, it's setting off the alarm bells yet at the G7. Um, well, markets, yeah, but, you know, but, but, we're dealing so, with an unprecedented global, uh, removal of global liquidity, and that's, I think, the more important sort of global driver. Right. But when I, this is so important, and this comes up with all sorts of, uh, of good work, including uh, the two Redekers writing in Foreign Affairs. In 1960, the U.S. was 40% of the global economy. And we've come way, way down with a resurgent China. And we all know uh, the story as well. Do we overemphasize our international market analysis and our international economics as we try to analyze America and what American bonds and American equities are going to do? Well, of course, you know, the, the U.S. is not, uh, from an economic standpoint, is not as dominant as it, as it was. Obviously, as you pointed out, China has, has risen. But... To me, you know, it's, it's to, to, for instance, to, to take your, I think, line of reasoning further, you know, to talk about, you know, perhaps China, the yuan, you know, replacing the dollar, it, it's, it's, it's nowhere close to that because it doesn't have the, the track record, it doesn't have the deep uh, market size, market ex access. Remember, it's still, you know, he heavily controlled markets in, in China. Um, so, you know, to me, I think the yuan is something like 2.5% of, of global reserves. The U.S. is somewhere around 35%. Uh, you know, and it's sort of, you know, we've seen this, it's like an iceberg melting, you know, it's some, you know, the dollar's dominance is, has fallen or is falling, but it's at such an incremental pace that, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not something for, for you and I to, to worry about. I think it'll be for our, our, our kids or grandkids. Um, but that when, said, you know, it, the U.S. is still you, the leader. Wait, hold on you know, a second. Before we economic. let you go, when we only have a couple minutes left, and I do want to get your sense on what ECB President Christine Lagarde said today, do you think that it moves the needle that she came out and she actually confirmed that they plan to have uh, no negative yielding or never negative rate policies by the end of September? Well, Lisa, um, it's the first time she's come out and, and said that. Other, of the, uh, other sort of more hawkish officials have, have always sort of laid out that timeline. But if you look at the calendar, um, a hike in July and a hike in September does take you basically to zero. And uh, another hike in October and December, uh, two hikes are priced in. And that's, that's actually steady from, was, uh, from last week. So in a sense, it hasn't moved the needle on, on the rates market. Uh, you know, the market is still looking for uh, you know, 0 0.5 by year end. Peak policy rate of 1.5% sometime over the next 24 months. But um, the zero has reacted. There's no doubt about that. So I think it's a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, we could get up as, above as, as uh, close to 109.30, I think, which is a high from a few months ago. But I still look at this as a corrective move. You know, I still think the U.S. dollar, the U.S. <laughs> outlook remains the best. Um, you know, we're seeing a correction. We've had a huge move in the dollar over the last uh, couple of months. Um, but obviously, you know, again, it's, it's mm -hmm. a bit about this pendulum of sentiment. It, right now, this pendulum well, going, is moving towards the euro. Um, but I expect, you know, somewhere the truth is somewhere in between. Right. Winston, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. With Brown Brothers Harriman as well. I think to go from Jason Furman to Dr. Thin and then to our next guest shows the span of the debate here in Davos. Especially given the realities on the ground. We talk about oil prices. We talk about the inflation and how it hits the middle class. This is also a big discussion of food insecurity here at the World Economic Forum and what that does to the social fabric of many of the developing nations. I agree nations. with that. I, I think the social issue this time around is this food inflation. The, uh, the Economist magazine with our cover on food, right. uh, the food crisis, really getting a nice play here uh, as well. But so much of it is about the constraints that the international community has to the shock of war in Ukraine and the shock of what we're seeing in the markets worldwide. We will go to the source with Barry Eichengreen. I can't believe I'm saying this. 20, I think 24 years ago, Ricardo Hausman changed the dialogue of economics and it is very evident today in the constraints that nations have amid this food crisis. Please stay with us on radio, on television, across America and worldwide. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. President Biden says he'll review Trump era tariffs imposed on imports from China. That led to a rally in the offshore yuan. The Biden administration has maintained most of the tariffs imposed by his predecessor. But the president has come under pressure from some lawmakers and economists and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to reduce or eliminate them. And President Biden is seeking to reassure Americans about the current monkeypox outbreak at a news conference in Tokyo. The president said it was unlikely to cause a pandemic on the scale of the coronavirus. He said the U.S. has enough smallpox vaccine stockpiled to deal with the outbreak. And a plane load of more than 70,000 pounds of baby formula has arrived in the U.S. An Air Force jet flew it from Germany to Indianapolis. It's the start of an emergency program to alleviate a national shortage that has left some parents scrounging to feed their children. And in New York, police are searching for a man who shot and killed a Goldman Sachs employee on a subway train. Daniel Enriquez was 48 and had worked for Goldman since 2013. Goldman calls the death a senseless tragedy. An increase in assaults on New York's subway system has prompted Mayor Eric Adams to boost the number of officers on patrol. Bank of America is increasing its minimum hourly wage to $22. That's another step towards reaching its goal of $25 an hour by 2025. Five years ago, the bank's base hourly wage was $15. Like a lot of employers, B of A is beefing up compensation and benefits in what is a tight labor market. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. projecting a lower growth than we anticipated last year, 3.6% versus 4.9%. But let's remember, 3.6% is the average growth in the previous decade. In other words, we are still projecting to be in positive territory. We do not anticipate a global recession. Kristalina Gorgieva of the International Monetary Fund. I'll be doing a panel with her Deputy Managing Director, Gita Gopinath, here on growth, which is hugely anticipated. They said there was a feverish to get in the room. There's these big rooms here at this fancy uh, place, and to get in the room to worry about growth yeah. front and center. <laughs> I mean, honestly, right that's what everybody wants to do. And yeah. what are these, uh, you know, as you call them, muckety mucks, going to say other than, especially if they're right. heading major global organizations, other than to say it's not inevitable that we're going to get a recession. There's still a yeah. lot of strength, which there is. We're learning so much here, including Tang here. Is Tang? Yeah, Tang. Tang. With the food. Tang. Yeah, exactly. He's drinking Tang. Uh, While well, we take a look at yeah. a world uh, that is very much in turmoil. Well, it is in turmoil. And what we're trying to do is lay the groundwork here. We're going to have Rebecca Patterson with us in a bit talking about the markets. But we continue from Jason Furman and Ek Ten and on to Win Thin Encyclopedic on the Pacific Rim. And someone that has been with us through the many years at Davos, Ricardo Hausman joins us now. The title is Practice of Economic Development Professor the Harvard Kennedy School, but that barely describes his contribution to economics with Barry Eichengreen on original sin and also of his Venezuela. You and I, Professor, one historic day here when Venezuela was once again blowing up. President Biden is sending out solicitations to Saudi Arabia and to your Venezuela. Should he be doing that? Well, I think that uh, for Saudi Arabia, definitely uh, it can be a game changer. The world is now uh, for, um, concerned about not only uh, uh, energy security, but also energy affordability. Uh, the world wants to reduce uh, Russian oil production. Uh, it would be good to have OPEC guarantee uh, sufficient supply. So I think, you know, Russia joined OPEC in a structure called OPEC Plus in December 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get OPEC away from Russia. And one way to do it is to tell OPEC, look, 
Uh, we are going to restrict Russia's access to oil technology. We're going to restrict Russia's access to international financial markets. We're going to restrict Russia's access to uh, oil, oil markets. So we're going to make sure that Russia's uh, market share in oil shrinks. But help us do it in a responsible way by you taking up the slack uh, to keep prices relatively stable. So I think it's strategic uh, to redefine the relationship with, with OPEC. I think Venezuela is not a player. Venezuela is not producing oil because they have destroyed the whole ecosystem to, to produce oil. And uh, you know a little change here or there is not going to change the picture in Venezuela, and it's not going to change the picture of the oil market. But to Tom's point here, it's a little bit out of the fire and into the frying pan, or out of the fry frying pan and into the fire when it comes to uh, needing oil that much more and setting prices up. Is there a more effective way for the West to go about this to hurt Russia more than Russia is hurting the West? Absolutely. Uh, you see, if you embargo Russia's oil and, and it cannot come out, then Russian oil production is going to come down. Uh, world prices are going to go up. Uh, the oil producers become richer and the oil consumers become poorer. And so it's a very expensive policy uh, for, say, Europe. If you want a policy that gets right, what you want really is to get Russia's oil, but for Putin not to get the money. And the way to do that is you just tax uh, the oil. Since Russian oil has to compete with Saudi oil or with uh, you know, um, Emirati oil, uh, it will have to be more or less the same price, right? Except that one pays the tax. So uh, for Russia, they would have to put a discount so large. He sounds like that a this... Trump advisor. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the issue, right? That a lot of people are opposed to this. Why hasn't why this, not... yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why hasn't this well, been more Well, no, Secretary Yellen came out, came out in favor of it. And she said that she was going to propose it at the G7 meeting. So it makes all the sense in the world. Because right. if you are only taxing Russian oil, you're not taxing all oil. So Russian oil with the tax will have to compete with the mm -hmm. rest of the oil. So a Russian oil after tax, the, the amount of money that Putin gets, is going to go down. And that's something that can be done now. Weaning Europe mm -hmm. out of oil is going to take months or years. Uh, but the war is now. You want to harm Russia now, not in a, in a few months or in a few years. So it's just smarter. In, in that world, Russian oil still comes out. So world oil prices don't go up, but the cash flow of Russia is hurt. So I think it's just a smarter right, way to wage this war. You own the high yeah. ground with Barry Eichengreen of thinking about how emerging markets can respond in financial markets and also within trade flows in real economies as well. Should we be afraid now of emerging market fragilities given a pandemic? given a war in Ukraine, and maybe also given big economy irresponsibility. How fragile are they? Well, I think that it's a mixed bag. So we can talk about individual countries. But in general, in, in the emerging markets, there is a lot of commodity exporters for which the current situation is a positive shock. Uh, you know, they are either exporting oil or minerals or agricultural products, and all of those are, uh, have gone up in price, and, and that's generating a more income for the country as a whole. In a country, say, like, uh, like South Africa, um, you know, the net effect on, on the country is positive, but it's super positive on the government mm -hmm. and negative on households. So you have a, 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 a domestic problem of how do you do, mm -hmm. you know, what does the government do with its, uh, with its unexpected right. extra income, and, and how do you cushion the blow on households because energy right. prices are up and food prices are up. They are producers right. of food and they are producers of energy, but still their prices I've are up. I've got to squeeze this in. In the greater Car Caribbean, how do we promote democracy? You have been doing this for decades. Cuba... The Castro regime moves on to something new and different, the mess in your Venezuela. How do we promote democracy within the greater Monroe Doctrine? Well, I think, uh, you know, first of all, it's not a, it's not a short fight. It's a fight, uh, you know, uh, these countries are supported by the likes of Putin and, uh, uh, and you know, so, so, you know, winning in Ukraine uh, is going to... To the extent that it harms uh, Russia, it's going to harm Venezuela 
Venezuelan dictatorship and the Cuban dictatorship and the Nicaraguan dictatorship. So I think uh, it's just a long haul and we have to keep right. at it until until you know well, we get to reestablish democracy. That's what Elliot Cohen said in his article on statecraft and foreign affairs. We've got to get at, got to it, make it for the long haul and keep at it. Ricardo Hausman of Harvard, thank, thank you so you. much for joining us. I said, I just want to, don't get up right now. You're going to walk in front of camera 42 <laughs> Maybe, and ruin well, the but, Heidi talking in front of the he made He made such a good point there, though. Honestly, this idea of the government, you know, it might be getting the money, but if it's not effective, oh, it'll yeah. just be hurting the population. And this is where some of the social uproar is, uh, is a big concern like for a lot of people. It's an economics course today. <laughs> I know, a Harvard economics course. It's very good. Uh, to bring it to you. Constructive markets after what you've enjoyed the last couple of weeks. Yields moving, but Enjoyed. much more importantly, equities uh, with a lift. Please stay with us next. Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater. From Davos, good morning. There's a pervasive fog of negative sentiment out there. When every single headline is negative, it's time to buy. I still think the dollar is going to be king in this sort of environment. So the earnings are super powerful and stocks are cheap at this point. The bond in the stock market are trading as one. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen from the meetings of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. A very different Davos this year in May, not in January. And I've been stunned, jarred, Lisa, at the changes. I just did not expect the difference in energy, the ballet of a beautiful May morning. Yeah, it's very different than uh, tripping over the ice and dealing with snow and freezing. It's also a very different moment right now in Wall Street that everyone's assembling. And frankly, on the heels of the pandemic, a quieter Davos, right. but one that's also more serious and focused. More serious like 2009, 2008, but different, different, different. You brought it up earlier and that and again, we brought it up last week. It's not a Davos of catharsis out there or emotion. It's just the slog in interest rates and the worry about recession grinding along through this 2022. And, and a changed geopolitical landscape to really uh, highlighted by the fact that Russia is not here and all that that entails. The idea that we have a very shifted landscape that we're looking at right now. What does it mean to be globalized in a world where people are trying well, to find how to get things quickly and reliably despite some of the disruptions? And Joe Stiglitz has joined us as well. He was walking by me and he was deglobalized as we uh, walked by here. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, uh, Lisa's going to brief you right now and what we're going to do staggering through uh, the morning and the next number of days and then we'll take a quick look at markets that are quiescent uh, this morning. What I would say more than anything a euro edges up to a 107. Why did that happen? Lisa? Because Christine Lagarde came Lagarde out said in a note yeah. and she basically was saying that she sees getting to uh, to eroding oh. the negative yielding oh. policies by the end of oh. September and actually really taking a more hawkish tone which is giving right. a bit of a lift. No, I thought it was a shorter to double espresso at the espresso bar. 10-year yield, 2.83% as well. And very seriously, Brent crude resilient, 113, even 114. Uh, that gets my attention in global price. Not shown in our data check. Weed up today, not through record levels, but the food crisis is front and center. What do we yeah, have ahead? The food crisis of front and center, as well as how we're dealing with climate change issues at a time when gas and oil has new predominance. And frankly, people seem to be putting aside the ESG. Speaking on that, we're going to be talking with John Kerry, among the many people who are going to be speaking with the U.S. Special Climate Envoy and former U.S. Secretary of State, uh, also the senator from Massachusetts, as you, of course, always allude to. Joseph Stiglitz will be talking about being globalized or deglobalized. We'll see which way mm -hmm. he leans this uh, today. Globally, uh, Columbia University professor and Nobel laureate will be joining us in this hour. David Rubenstein, uh, Carlisle Group co-chair and co-founder, and of course, host of peer-to-peer -peer conversations. But right now, the conversation, Tom, that we're about to have really sums up. Can we get a reprieve from the seven straight weeks well, of declines, the longest stretch going back to 2001? Is this, what we're seeing this morning, a head fake, or is it really the start of a buy the dip? And it goes to the synthesis that that we're in here, and it's the market coverage of equities, bonds, currencies, bonds. Rebecca Patterson has dealt in all those areas, and it's culminated after her work at Bessemer 
with Bridgewater, where she is chief investment strategist uh, with a guy named Prince and Dalio as well. Are Prince, are Prince and Dalio on speaking terms? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> what, what's the latest meetings like in terms of the volatility we're seeing, the complexities and nuances? What is the tone within your meetings as you assess this 2022? Well, uh, obviously, as you hinted at, Lisa, there's just so much changing now, structurally as well as cyclically. And so there's a lot of, of people saying, where are we going? Not just the next month or next quarter, but the next five to 10 years. If we do deglobalize or regionalize, what does that look like? What are the implications of that? Uh, as well as the short-term worries over can the Fed, will the Fed tighten enough to get inflation back down to its target? If we have higher, stickier inflation for longer, mm -hmm. how does that flow through to the market? So a lot of uncertainty if I had to sum it up. How do you determine whether a move like what we're seeing ahead of the open today is a head fake or not? Well, we don't trade daily wiggles in the market. So we'd take a step back and say, OK, what's discounted? A lot has changed since the beginning of the year. I think the biggest change has been discounted tightening by central banks, particularly the Fed. And we have seen that flow through clearly to the bond markets. And we have seen the equity decline so far largely a function of the change in discount rates. You haven't seen a major change in expected earnings growth. And so that to us is the thing we're watching. If this is a head fake or continuing, that would be the shoe to drop. If the Fed continues to tighten to try to reduce demand to get inflation under control, I would expect to see that flow through into discounted growth, which then eventually should bring equities that next leg lower. For years, people were saying that markets were benefiting even though the economy was not. And that actually we saw all of the financialization represented by an S&P on a vertical trajectory. Are we heading into the opposite? Can we be heading into the opposite, where we see markets lag behind an economy that continues to be strong? Actually, that has been our view and continues to be our view as we look ahead, that we're in a situation now where the nominal economy is likely to outperform financial markets fairly substantially. Um, and that is mainly a function of the policy reaction we got during the pandemic. You know, all the fiscal and monetary stimulus that came through and left households wealthier than before the pandemic, corporate balance sheets stronger than before the pandemic, it gives them a cushion to withstand the tightening. So it is going to feed through to markets. And obviously that wealth effect will also feed through to the economy. But that starting strong nominal right. point for the economy means financial assets could underperform. You've got it, Bridgewater, in your fancy kitchen. They get the whole Sub-Zero thing, you know, like the big stove. Well, look who's that. talking, Bloomberg yeah. Kitchen, got, hello. You've got, <laughs> Living you've got in the, the Ray Dalio <laughs> Memorial Pressure Cooker. And the only reason he hired you is the steam coming out of the kettle is the currency market. To me, the conundrum here, and you beautifully described the fiscal impulse and the wealthing that occurred, and maybe the de-wealthing that's occurred now, what, what releases the pressure is dollar dynamics. Mm -hmm. What kind of pressures will we see? Well, I think the most important thing to understand about the dollar right now is how quickly our external need for foreign capital is, is increasing. So if you go on your Bloomberg page, it'll show our current account deficit for the United States at around Stunning. three and a half percent, which is already a big widening. Mm -hmm. Our timely estimates suggest that's closer to five or six percent of GDP. And so for the dollar to stay supported, we need to continue getting enough capital to offset right. that. And we think there's a growing risk around that. So the dollar, we think, is vulnerable on a cyclical basis and also a structural basis. This is important. It's Steve Roach 101. Someone has supported us for years here in, in, in Davos. And if we get a twin deficit, do you link those two together mathematically or philosophically? Do you link current account with recession gloom together or are they two separate events? Well, they, they are mathematically linked. As, as you know well, Tom, you're being humble. Yeah, you do. <laughs> but I think what, what we're following it's like, mean, it's like This is a tip, pro surveillance tip. Yeah. Don't ask the question unless you know the answer. <laughs> it's just like Judge Judy, continue. So the, the current account, the balance of payments is what I'm focused on relatively more. Um, and so that financing need is the, is the canary in the coal mine. If U.S. Yep. growth continues to outperform the rest of the world, if interest rates in the U.S. continue to be so much more attractive, both on an absolute level and on a change basis, then maybe the U.S.
U.S. does continue to hold up for the dollar, but it's a question mark. So where, 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 do they, where does the money go well, if it doesn't go to the well, U.S.? Well, let's look. Let's look. I mean, year to date, Japanese equities are actually outperforming U.S. equities if you take out the currency effect. Um, UK stocks are outperforming US stocks. Some emerging market equities are outperforming. And so not all the capital is flooding here. It is looking for opportunities where policymakers are less constrained, where valuations are a lot less demanding, where positions, where exposure is, is a lot more moderate. What you said about yields being attractive to other nations, how high do Treasury yields have to go in order to remain that attractive to support the dollar? That's a great question, and I don't have a number for you, but what, what is interesting to us when we look at the bond market, so we try to understand all the different players in every market and what motivates them to buy or sell. And when we look at the U.S. bond market today, even though you have less issuance, for the Fed flipping from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening is obviously very significant. But the big player that we're watching that we think is, is suggests more upside for bond yields are banks. So a year ago, you had a steep curve. You had a ton of deposits coming in, and the right. banks were putting that into bonds. So you had a lot of demand keeping down the yield. That's over. The curve is flatter. The deposit inflow is slower. So mm -hmm. there's less bank buying of bonds to hold down the yield. So when we look at who's going to buy those bonds if the Fed's out, we still see a supply demand imbalance that to us suggests well, yields higher. I don't know what the magic number is, but we still think we have further to go on the upside. To go electrical engineering on you, this is within the perfect electrical system of Switzerland, and trust me, folks, it is perfect. The slew rates here that you're describing, how do you affect an interest rate parity strategy, a sophisticated hedge, if you will, given slew rates we've never seen before? Are you talking about risk parity or are yeah. we talking about, yeah. yeah. So what's so interesting to, to me about all of this is when you think about how most investors in the world have positioned for the last one or two decades, they have been biased towards rising growth and falling inflation. That's 60-40, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to do your equities do well, growth out. is rising, et cetera. Right. It worked great till now. So it's and the world has gone upside down. So now we have falling growth and rising inflation. Obviously, we've seen the portfolio hit those folks have taken. The difference with risk parity strategies is that they're balanced for growth and inflation. So even if bond yields are going up, you have balance in other parts of the portfolio, namely commodities okay. and other inflation sensitive assets. So they tend to hold up better through the cycles, including these okay. periods. If they let me go back to New York, can you come back and visit us to continue this discussion? Of course, because always. To me, it's the arch financial question for our listeners and viewers is the death of 6040. Right. Recalibration. Rebecca Patterson, just Thank brilliant. You. Thank you so much. By the way, yeah. maybe we won't go back to New York. You know, Thomas Gottstein of uh, Credit Suisse <clears throat> saying that we're all going to work remote part of the time, so we could, you know, work remote from the hills. Uh, there you go. I was waiting for it. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. We're going to continue on here. We've got much more coming up through the next number of days, including an important conversation with the former Secretary of State, John Kerry, a special presidential envoy for climate for President Biden. On radio and television, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Rich Gupta. The White House is now walking back President Biden's comments on Taiwan. In Tokyo, the president said the U.S. military would intervene to defend Taiwan in any attack from China. That appeared to break the longstanding U.S. policy of so-called strategic ambiguity. The White House later said the president simply meant the U.S. would provide military equipment to Taiwan, not send troops. And the Biden administration announced that a dozen Indo-Pacific countries will join the U.S. in a sweeping economic initiative. The goal is to counter China's influence in the region. Australia, India, Japan, South Korea and New Zealand are included, along with seven Southeast Asian countries. But the new framework doesn't include any tariff reductions and it's unclear which parts are binding. In Australia, the Labour Party's Anthony Albanese has been sworn in as Prime Minister. He defeated former Prime Minister Scott Morrison, Morrison in an election held on Saturday. He's promising swift action on climate change, greater gender equality and improved wage growth. 
Pfizer and BioNTech say their COVID vaccine was highly effective and prompted a strong immune response in children under the age of five. That's likely to pave the way for infants and toddlers to finally get immunized. The companies say that in a preliminary finding, a three-dose regimen was 80% effective in children ages six months through four years old. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. There's no doubt we face serious global challenges right now. Inflation, uh, first and foremost among them, and it's hitting families hard. But there's also no doubt that the United States is in a better position than any other major country around the world to address inflation without giving up all the economic gains that we've had. And that's because of the strength of our recovery. Brian Deese, National Economic Council Director there on CNN, of course, talking up uh, the themes of the moment. We welcome all of you on radio and television, Lisa Abramowitz and myself, John Farrell, on assignment in Capri. And right now, while we've got a lot of things to speak of in a one-hour conversation, we will compress with John Kerry. He is U.S. Special Climate Envoy and former U.S. Secretary of State. And whatever your politics, he is someone who has honed our political debate of this nation for decades. It started at St. Paul's School. You were up at St. Paul's in Concord, New Hampshire, a few years really back, back, and it, debate and discussion was beaten into you, wasn't it? At yeah, Paul's. well, no, we, we had a terrific uh, tradition of back and forth, Socratic testing. No, it was a, bit, it was a really it was important tradition back then. What happened to America where we walked away <laughs> from the niceties of debate? Um, well, the United States Senate used to be the greatest deliberative body in the world. And obviously, a lot of people are anxious about where the deliberation is today. It, it's, it's changed. It, it's really changed. I think what happened is in the 1990s, our politics changed. It became far angrier, far more intense, far more personal. You remember the discussions of the politics of personal destruction. And now um, we have a lot of angry people who are, who are appropriately angry on either side of the aisle, right, left, and they just don't feel the government's delivering to them, and we have to change that. How does the U.S. lead with such disunity at home? Oh, I think President Biden is showing you how he lead right now. He's in uh, Asia uh, and uh, meeting with the Quad. He's been leading on global climate to change around the world. Yeah. He put America back into the, into, uh, put the United States back into the Paris Agreement, helped raise ambition in Glasgow, make Glasgow right. a success. Um, you know, I think people understand that we had four difficult years. Uh, the country decided that was an aberration and elected President Biden. Right. Now, uh, we're in the busy building back process, right. but I think we've made a lot of progress in the last year. The, the helicopter flying over says GOP on the side of it. I think that's what's going on <laughs> <laughs> right now. Senator Kerry, I, I want to talk to you about climate. Um, I was blown away a number of years ago with uh, the Bank of America people. It, you, you are not another face talking climate. You're not another celeb talking client. You've actually leaned over the desk uh, in Boston and said, I got to learn the math. I got to learn the statistics. It's been knocked asunder by the price of coal, by this war in Ukraine. What is your strategy to sustain our focus on climate change, given the tumult is measured by the price of coal? Well, President Biden has determined that over the course of the next months, we're going to get ready for the next meeting by trying to raise ambition around the world. We are very busy right now working with specific countries, Indonesia, Vietnam, South Africa, India, to bring capital to the table, to bring the finance and the technology to help them be able to deploy uh, to meet the goals of the Glasgow Paris Agreement. But in addition to that, we have to work to get the trillions of dollars deployed. This is going to cost literally trillions of dollars in order to effect the transition. 
And the way that we can do that is by bringing various players to the table, philanthropy, we, to help blend the finance. Yeah. So you have people taking first risk, people who are de-risking the investment. And hopefully, uh, w there are a lot of folks doing that. We have companies that are now signing up. On Wednesday, we'll be making a major announcement with Bill Gates, with Mark Benioff of Salesforce, others of CEOs who are directing their companies to become first movers. They're, they're, they're creating demand in the marketplace, mm -hmm. ordering 10% of the steel Volvo or Ford Motor Company will buy is going to be uh, green steel. Cement, well, the largest cement dealer in the world, Folsom Lafarge, is producing green cement. I mean, there, there's just a whole range of things in aluminum, in, in carbon removal, Senator, in shipping, we only in have aviation. Couple, we only have a couple minutes left, and I do want to get your sense. Yeah. On gas, you've talked about natural gas being central to the transition to a greener future, but not talked about investing over the next 30 to 40 years because you're hoping to transition away from that. How do you dovetail the now into the future? I think it's critical that uh, lending institutions that have a vast amount of capital involved in the fossil fuel industry begin to demand more from that industry. Uh, it is appropriate, I think, to have a gas transition for a short period, of, for some period of time, while you bring technology to scale that is going to change altogether what we're doing. Mm -hmm. There's an enormous amount of research right now, and frankly, there's about a trillion dollars of venture capital already moving towards these new technologies, green hydrogen, longer battery storage, direct air carbon capture, green uh, hydrogen. I mean, there, there are things that are going right. to just change the way businesses do business, and that's going to be part of this revolution. I think we're looking at, the, uh, and I don't think this is exaggeration, we're looking at the largest economic opportunity and transformation since the Industrial Revolution, and this will be bigger right. because every nation in the world is going to have to move to a clean, new energy economy and future. I want to center back here in the final question to the future of the Democratic Party. What we have seen is a centrist Joe Biden and you as a centrist John Kerry overrun by a rigid progressive or liberal wing of the Democratic Party. What is your counsel as they maybe lose the House, maybe lose the Senate, who knows, or the White House, but what is the counsel you have to liberals who will not bend as you have spent a career bending? Well, I, I like to think I haven't always been. I, I find the compromise where you can and you need to. But you have to be reasonable, obviously. And you have to recognize, I mean, the old saying in Washington, don't let the good, you know, don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. You have to find a compromise. That's the nature of legislating. If you decide you want to be a legislator, mm -hmm. do that. And, and we need to move in that direction. But I'm not in the politics of, of, of the back and forth now. I'm trying to bring people together, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, to understand that this crisis mm -hmm. is existential, doesn't have a political label, it's universal, it's not a bilateral issue between China and the United States. Right. It is existential for everybody on the planet, and we need to be well, smarter about coming to solutions. The best way you get there is through you know, winning an election, but then also compromising to find a Very path good. forward. John Kerry, thank you so much for joining thank us you. at Davos. He is U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. We've got much more coming up, including a conversation with Joe Stiglitz. Stay with us. the meetings of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. We welcome all of you, not in January, in May. Just a wonderful, <laughs> glorious first day here. Uh, Lisa, would you hike 20 miles today? <laughs> yeah, you know, not 20? today, but yesterday 22. I had a good time. It's beautiful here. It's warm really up is. yesterday. Yeah. Uh, John Farrell on assignment, as they say. You know, he's in Capri again, uh, but we wish him uh, well. Right now, a quick data check of markets doing better 
than expected. Uh, the 10 year yield up five basis points at 283. I would note Brent crude with a 113, 114 uh, trading range, but a more constructive market. And for John, we do the Dow Jones Industrial <laughs> Average Futures up over 300 points Talk as to well. Doing better than me in Davos is Romain Bostic in New York. Romain? Hey, good morning, uh, Tom and Lisa. Yeah, keep an eye here on the market. You talk about constructive uh, right now that we're seeing here in the pre-market here. We actually do have a pretty a decent rally. Volume is relatively light here in the pre-market, but it is a broad-based rally with a lot of the bank stocks and energy stocks providing a foundation here for some potential upside. Keep in mind, J.P. Morgan is actually having its investor day today. It's already released a presentation on its website that shows the company increasing its uh, outlook here for net interest income. The share is up about 1.5% on the day. Oxy and a lot of the other, uh, a lot of the other uh, oil and gas companies moving higher as well. Oxy up about 1.4 percent, and even some of the tech companies are getting in on the action today. Not by much, but you have Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Tesla, all moving higher here. You add that up, it's a big part of the reason why you're seeing green on the futures market in aggregate. Elsewhere, you want to keep an eye on what's going on in the software space. An interesting deal here, according to people familiar with the matter uh, that Bloomberg News has spoken to. Broadcom is said to be making a bid for VM. Now, this is going to be a big deal. A chip maker buying a software company. I remember Broadcom mm. has tried to sort of dabble in this space before with that uh, purchase of Symantec's enterprise software business. This will be a $40 billion deal if this does come to fruition. Broadcom shares down about 5% here uh, on the day and VMware up about 22% here in the pre-market. And Sega Technology is also a company moving. Keep an eye on a lot of these companies that make antiviral drugs. A lot of talk right now about monkeypox, Tom. Those shares up about 26% yeah. in the pre-market. Yeah, be careful. Out Romain Bostic, thank you so much. To close uh, this afternoon as well, uh, a more constructive uh, market. This is an important conversation. Each and every year at Davos, there is someone who owns the valley. Usually it's some rock star that shows up by helicopter, or maybe it's some famous model uh, that I don't know their name, you know, someone like that. This year's rock star is Joseph Stiglitz. He is the Nobel winner for the mysteries of information. He is someone at Columbia who has taught and written about our discontents and with the challenges of globalization, given war in Ukraine, a food crisis, and others, truly, Joe Stiglitz is the attendee this year at Davos. If you wrote globalization and its discontents today, what would be different? Oh, I think uh, when I wrote globalization and its discontent, I was mostly focused on the discontent in the South. Uh, in the developing countries and emerging markets. Since then, that discontent has become global. We've had globalization of global discontent. And I think part of the reason is that we've seen that globalization has left us in the United States unprepared for the COVID-19. We weren't able to uh, produce even simple things like face masks, protective gear, complicated things. And uh, now, uh, this broader discontent of globalization that I talked about uh, uh, with emerging markets and developing countries is showing up in a peculiar way in the lack of support for the West, for the United States and Europe and other democracies in the, uh, our position against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Well, before we get to that, though, is the inflation that we're seeing right now a symptom of these fissures, of these crises, whether it's Russia and the war in Ukraine or the lockdowns in China? Or is it just an exasperation of a deglobalization or reglobalization in a new form uh, that people haven't fully understood yet? Well, the disturbances are to a large extent a reflection of the same kind of short sightedness. Uh, failure of markets to attend to risk adequately that we saw in the 2008 crisis. I wrote my book, uh, Making Globalization Work, the sequel to Globalization and its Discontent, that it was extraordinarily risky for Germany to become so dependent on Russian gas. It was so clear uh, back then that Russia was not a reliable trade partner. Why would you put all your money, in the, uh, all your eggs in that basket? And yet, Germany did, Europe did, and part of what we're seeing now, because we didn't 
respond to climate change. You mm -hmm. had Senator Kerry here a few minutes ago talking about this. We should have, we should have moved to uh, renewable energy, right. realizing that it was more reliable than political dictators. So fast forward to today. And the policies that we're implementing, whether it's to try to curb Russia and, and, and to, to hamper them in their advance in Ukraine, or whether it comes to tariffs in China, what are we getting wrong? Oh, I, I think uh, we're n not getting enough solidarity. Uh, we're asking a few countries. They may have made mistakes in the future, in the past, but now we have to have solidarity. We're fighting a war right now. It's a global war. It's a war to preserve the international rule of law. And yet we're asking some of the poorest countries to bear, to bear a lot of the price in terms of higher food prices. They may starve. Okay. We're not doing anything about the debt crisis. So uh, in terms of managing a global alliance, we're right. failing. Joe, you came out of Gary, Indiana. It's flat on its back like no other city in the country. The Redekers, two academics writing in foreign affairs, talk about the initiatives forward where, hey, the fancy people maybe ought to pay attention to the middle class. How in this new America do we get the elites to join with the middle class like they did when you and I grew up? Well, I, I think that we all need to be aware our democracy is at risk. And our system, economic system, is at risk. So if we don't get that kind of solidarity, who knows where things will go? So do, you talked a little bit uh, before about inflation. It's really hurting uh, the people at the bottom and the middle uh, enormously. There are uh, oil companies making billions okay. of dollars. You, you, so well, you and I fought this battle in 1976. He had a VW rabbit. You would have loved it. <laughs> Joe, the bottom line is the elites have forgotten the middle class across the entire political persuasion. How do we re-engage and build a trust with the middle class in America, given the present shocks here in Happy Valley? I, I, I think that we have to uh, remind them uh, as I did try you know, an article I wrote 11 years ago of the 1% for the 1% and by the 1%, part of the message of that article in the Vanity Fair was to say that it is in your own self-interest to show a more solidarity, because if you don't, this whole system is going to fray apart. And also, this, Lisa, this is important, really important, given the years. And when you and Rogoff were on stage here, that honor, when the two, they, they haven't gotten along for years. <laughs> it's like the Kardashians. It's worse than that. Here's the heart of the matter. We had compensation structures in America where the middle class was attached to the elites. And then we changed it to where the elites are making more money than God and the middle class is left behind. And to me, that was a tipping point. This has been a tipping point, and here we are with a new tipping point with inflation, and just want to end here. Do you think that it's more important to get inflation under control at this moment than to uh, worry about or avoid some sort of downturn, which seems to be the Fed's conundrum? Uh, raising interest rates is not going to solve the problem of inflation. It's not going to create more food. Uh, it's going to make it more difficult because you aren't going to be able to make the investment. Then how do you raising, clear the market if you don't raise interest rates? What you do is you have supply side interventions. Uh, one of the things that President Biden tried to do is to have more uh, care for children, and that would mean more women into the labor force. That releases one of the uh, uh, constraints, labor supply. Uh, you look at, we used to have surpluses in food in the United States. But all this takes time. We can time. get those back. How do we do this in a time-sensitive way? I, th I think we can do a lot more mm -hmm. than we're doing. Uh, can you Killing the economy through raising interest rates is not going to be a okay. solution in any time frame. So at least trying to do everything we can right. globally to increase the supply is going to do more on dealing with the okay. problem one, than causing a depression. One last seven. question. Your heated rhetoric melted all the snow in the valley. <laughs> Let's go all scoop Jackson on you right now, the giant from Washington State. Can you, as a raging Democrat, support a fiscal rebuilding of our defense 
and of our Navy to push against China and the shock of Putin and Russia? Uh, I think we can uh, have uh, uh, support defense. We clearly, Putin has shown we need defense. Much of what we spend is weapons that don't work against enemies that don't exist. So if we take our current spending on defense and re-examine it, I mean, we're, pay, mm -hmm. we're so much back in the 20th century, the latter half of the 20th century, yep. we're in a, uh, we're a world of cyber warfare, mm -hmm. of all kinds of new forms of warfare. Mm -hmm. We need to adapt uh, our, our military expenditure. I think if we did that, we don't have to spend more and more and more. We have to spend smarter and smarter okay. and smarter. We're out of time. Joe Stiglitz, thank you for an annual thank visit. Thank you so here. much. Thank professor you. from Columbia University. And I will say most seriously, folks, a reading of globalization and its discontent is a good place to start on a study of international economics. He's got like 14 other books out after that, but that's the one where you can get started with Stiglitz 101. Coming up from Carlisle, the television star, David Rubenstein. <laughs> Stay with us from the World Economic Forum in Davos. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. President Biden says he'll review Trump-era tariffs imposed on imports from China. That led to a rally in the offshore yuan. The Biden administration has maintained most of the tariffs imposed by his predecessor, but the president has come under pressure from some lawmakers and economists and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to reduce or eliminate them. And President Biden is seeking to reassure Americans about the current monkeypox outbreak. At a news conference in Tokyo, the president said it was unlikely to cause a pandemic on the scale of the coronavirus. He said the U.S. has enough smallpox vaccine stockpile to deal with the outbreak. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia's economy should be shut off from the world. And he invited global investors to shift their resources into Ukraine to help rebuild the country in a video address. The World Economic Forum in Davos, Zelensky said this is the moment when it is decided whether brute force will rule the world. And in New York, police are searching for a man who shot and killed a Goldman Sachs employee on a subway train. Daniel Enriquez was 48 and had worked for Goldman since 2013. Goldman calls the death a senseless tragedy. An increase in assaults on New York's subway system has prompted Mayor Eric Adams to boost the number of officers on patrol. HSBC reportedly has suspended an executive after he criticized the finance industry for worrying too much about climate change. According to the Financial Times, the bank is conducting an internal investigation into Stuart Kirk's remarks. Kirk is the head of a responsible investing for HSBC's asset management unit. Global News, 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg. Quick take powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. very clear that people are somewhat insecure, they are in risk off mode, uh, but uh, our house view still is that there won't be a recession, neither this year nor next yeah. year. There will be a slowdown. I think our house view global GDP is 3.3% for this year and 29 for, for yeah. next year. He is the chief executive officer of a bank in Switzerland, Credit Suisse, and Thomas Gottstein is not in a risk off mode looking at his bank and looking at a financial system beleaguered right now. Tom Keene with Lisa Bramos, John Farrell is in Capri, uh, which is a good and beautiful uh, thing. What have we learned so far? I think it's been a really strong start to uh, four days. I think that the churn of uncertainty, I mean, trying to solve problems yeah. that you were trying to identify and really define at a moment when we just saw the longest streak of losses in the market going right. back to 2001, how do we pivot forward at a time of rising inflation, failing investing models yeah. of the 60-40? Let's dive into a conversation with someone who's had world, world leadership and quality conversations. David Rubenstein joins us. Of course, you know him with his work on Bloomberg. He's co-chairman and co-founder of Carlisle Group. Uh, he's on the board of uh, the World Economic Forum and I think owns like three cantons in Switzerland. Switzerland is, well, wonderful to have you here today. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Is it better in the summer or the winter? It's a lot easier to get around in the summertime no, and you don't have to worry about falling yeah. down. At least I don't have to worry about right. it so much. I know you had a little slip, but you're okay, right? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm doing fine. Um, let us talk about what underlies and underpins every transaction at Carlisle. 
every transaction of President Biden, and that is a financial system where it is price down, yield up. If I take the Lehman Index, the Bloomberg Total Return Aggregate Index, essentially, David, we've never seen this. How does the financial system adapt to such losses in bonds? Well, the financial system will adapt. It always does. Uh, markets uh, correct, and the markets will correct now. I think we've had a time of enormous ebullience in the markets, low interest rates, uh, very high growth rates, and now it's changing. You can't go on forever uh, as it was, so now it's slowing down a bit. I don't think it's a calamitous situation, but clearly the, the growth market right now is not great, and I would say interest rates are going to come up for a while and probably put us into what somebody in the Carter administration used to call a banana. Uh, he didn't want to use the word recession, so Carter said, don't use the word recession, use some other word. And Fred Kahn, the inflation advisor, said, all right, I think we might be in a banana. So I don't want to <laughs> say we're in a recession. I don't know if we're in a banana, but it's some, something close between a recession and a banana. Okay, so then Biden this morning when he was asked about it should have said banana because you think that that's the more realistic outcome. There are many different definitions of recession, so I don't want to be quoted saying we're in a recession. Nobody really knows yet for sure, but clearly the economy is not as robust as it was the last couple of years, in part because of COVID, the, the effects of that, in part because of uh, the war in, in Ukraine, and in part because interest rates are going up again. And so if all those things come together, it's not a great economic environment. On the other hand, if you're an investor, prices have come down to the point where there's some really good bargains now, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people that buy at the bottom are looking uh, pretty happy now. But do you think that right now this is a bottoming out? that you see, in other words, from the conversation that right. you're having, is there more optimism about investing now than pessimism about the recession or banana? Well, it depends. Um, if you own a lot of these assets and they've gone down, you're not so optimistic. But if you don't own those assets and you now have some fresh capital to invest, it's a lot better now than it was a while ago because prices are a lot low. A price, if you own assets, the ones you own may not be worth as much, but you don't have to sell those assets at these prices. But right now, people are going to make a lot of money buying at these prices, I believe, because prices are pretty low now right. relative to where they've been. But, David, to Andrew Mellon in another time and place, are we going to see the elites do a national roll-up of our assets while with inflation the middle class is flat on their back? And to get specific, Blackstone take, taking the heat, but private equity, private money is going after residential housing as a sound investment. And there's a raging debate about that. Is this, a, is this a shell game of the elites where the middle class wow. beleaguered doesn't get to participate? Well, first of all, Blackstone and Carlisle and other firms, they basically represent pension funds to a large extent, which are teachers, firemen, policemen, so forth. So it's not exactly the elites who are buying it for themselves. They're buying it for pension funds to a large extent. Secondly, um, the economy is much different than Andrew Mellon's period of time. Then yes, a few people I'll did control the economy. So now it's a much bigger economy, and it's a global economy. It wasn't when Andrew Mellon was uh, Secretary of Treasury. Meanwhile, we are looking at the turmoil, and I do wonder whether you think that Davos still has the same relevancy that it once did. Davos, I think, is relevant because people are still coming. If people didn't come, it wouldn't be relevant. People are coming because when you can go in one place and see the CEOs and the heads of state of so many different places, it's a good thing. It's very convenient. So if I wanted to see some of the people here, I would have to spend six months going around and meeting all these people. Now I can right. meet them in a couple days here. So it's very relevant. Now, are we going to solve all the global problems in the world in the next four days? Probably not. But I don't see anybody that comes here and says, you know, I wish I was somewhere else. People come here because they think it's actually a good chance to meet other people. And because we've been in COVID environment for so long, some of these people haven't been seen by others for three or four years in person. I haven't seen some of these people for three years. Robert Hormatz a couple days ago was heated with us about the rebuild of our relationship with the Pacific Rim. What can private capital do to assist our government in projecting a new America vision there? You know, I think of the Ayala family in the Philippines and other large pools right. of capital. Don't we assist our nation by projecting and advancing capital to the Pacific Rim? We, we do, and we are. I mean, a lot of the private equity firms and other large corporations are investing enormous amounts of money in Asia. Asia has grown dramatically in the last 40 or 50 years since Nixon went to China. It's an incredible, incredibly different world. Um, we aren't pulling back dramatically. I think the investment in China is pulling back a bit because of some of the regulatory concerns there and the ec economic concerns in COVID. But money is flowing into other countries. India is a good example. Japan is a good example. Uh, Korea is a good example. A lot of Western money is going in there now. So I don't think we're pulling 
pulling out from the Pacific Rim. And I think Biden is, when he's there now, as he is, he's talking about American capital coming in. I think American capital is coming in. David Rubenstein, thank you so much for joining with Kyle. Thank you for your conversation thank you. on Bloomberg. My pleasure. Thank My you for having me. My favorite of all time is Jeff Bezos. But he, was, he was the best. He, he, I don't know if he was the best, but it was just great how you hammered him. I mean, it was great. Thank you very much. David Rubenstein, thank you uh, I, again. I think what's so important here is, and this Davos is so different from 2009, people aren't shocked by the system. They're shocked by... The, the, the war is the fundamental difference right now. We didn't have that in 2009. And this feeling of constant shocks. I mean, we came from a pandemic, that crisis. Now we're dealing with the crisis of Ukraine. Crisis. And now we're dealing with the shutdowns in China, prolonging supply chain disruptions. How well, do you deal with crisis upon crisis overlaid with an inflation we haven't seen since the 1970s? And that angst yeah. is underpinning all discussions. It's my theme of the Davos this year, and I'm stealing it from George Will in 2001 from Robert Gates, our defense secretary, and uh, played up recently, the holiday from history is over. And so yeah. there's a I thought you were just going to sing for us. Our original things. I'm not going to no, In gonna the hills. Sing he now. goes into no. the Alps and just, you Let's know. Let's do a data tries. check here with, you know, a nice up to the market. Uh, it is a different feeling than the crisis we've seen over the last uh, number of days. And all in all, uh, a better bond market uh, as well, showing a little bit of confidence within the system. 282 on the 10 year uh, yield. Brent crude 113 as well. Coming up on the markets, we'll start the hour on the markets back in New York. Matt Brill will join us, head of US investment grade at Invesco. From Davos, stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Inflation in some places is continuing to accelerate here. I don't think we felt the full implications. Companies are having difficulty managing an inflation environment. I still think this is a year or two where the U.S. is going to continue to outperform rest of the world. The Fed is tightening interest rates, and that means equities are likely to go down as they have been. Everybody is now worried about a global slowdown. I am too. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. A moment of calm in markets. The world's elite joining us at the World Economic Forum, where we are broadcasting live in Davos, Switzerland. Good morning to all of you back in New York, to London, to those in Switzerland. This is Bloomberg Surveillance live on Bloomberg Television and Radio, alongside Tom Keen, John Farrow off. What did you say on assignment in Capri? Capri. Uh, he's world going to be checking. Capri. <laughs> exactly, Capri Team style. Coverage. And uh, we'll perhaps be heading there next. Uh, but I digress from a moment where we reassess the landscape that we're in after crisis, after crisis. For those of you on radio, we're reassessing the green behind us. It is gorgeous here in Switzerland. We all know that. That's not news. But really, Lisa, our first here for the World Economic Forum, 51 years of what Klaus Schwab invented uh, here with the pandemic and all. They're trying to get it going again from January of 2020. But what stuns me is how this is such a different Davos even from 2008 and from the shock of 2009. Well, it's not cold for one, right? So there is that issue. But besides that, there is a recapitulation of what it means to solve problems at a time when you have food prices that are spiraling, you have conflict in Ukraine, and you're dealing with this frustration with markets. And I keep going back to the seven straight weeks of losses on the S&P yeah. and the NASDAQ, yeah. the mm. longest stretch since 2001 for the Dow, for those of you who do track it. It's the longest streak of losses, eight weeks straight of uh, declines going back that. to 1923. I, not, I, well, I remember top. that well. So well, there, there is a feeling of calm today. As we mentioned with David Rubenstein, and, and I'm, I'm not going to let up on this, the bond market gets equal treatment. The carnage in the bond market is tangible. You can rationalize it all you want. The fact is, it's tangible. In the markets, when you talk to strategists, they have a belief, a lot of them, that the Fed will come in and will save the market by not raising rates too much. I didn't hear much. that from Jason Furman. I didn't hear that from Jason Furman. I didn't hear that from a lot of different individuals who are speaking with here at the World Economic Forum. That, I think, is the tension underpinning the people who are bulls and the people mm -hmm. who are bears at this moment. And the, uh, the feeling just in the first day here is it's really interesting. It's a much more international audience on a percentage basis. Basis, I would suggest fewer Americans, maybe fewer uh, from the United Kingdom. But even with that, 
There is a heated conversation that we'll dive into on economics, on international relations, but we are not going to forget uh, the market turmoil we're in. We'll get to Matt Brill here uh, in a moment. Let me show the data to you once more. It's a quiescent uh, screen here with equities up today. I don't know what Dow futures are. John Farrell says it doesn't matter, <laughs> uh, but the yield is up a little bit. Dollar comes in uh, weaker. I've got Brent crude near a 113 uh, level. West Texas Intermediate, 1. 11. This is, to me, the most interesting guest of the day. We've got lots of good guests and great guests like Joe Stiglitz on globalization. But interesting is the bond market. And this is Lisa's wheelhouse. I'll begin and she'll take over. Matthew Brill joins us. He's out of North America, investment grade credit at Invesco. Matthew, I look at the Bloomberg total return investment grade index and I want to know how do I begin to make money back? How do re I recover from those double-digit losses? Hey, good morning, Tom. Wish I was with you out there. It looks, it looks great. Um, yeah, it's been a, a really, really tough market for U.S. investment-grade credit all year. Um, you're down roughly 13%. It's the, the worst start to a year. It will be the worst year ever if it ended today. Um, but, you know, the good things are we seem to be seeing some stabilization now. We're starting to actually see negative correlation between Treasury yields and credit spreads um, for the first time all, yield, uh, all year. So that's a good thing. We're starting to see investors come in and you're looking at 12 year highs on investment grade yields. So the valuations are, are there. Um, you're starting to see the negative correlations, which is good. Um, but you, you're, real still, you're still seeing people just very apprehensive to invest. And, and I, I think you're at a decent point where you're going to claw back some of the losses, but, but you're, not, you're obviously not going to get them all back this year. But you at least should start the, the, the ability to not lose money from this point, which I think is the first step in actually making money. Matt, how much conviction do you have and do the people that you speak with have at a time when a lot of it is contingent on the Fed backing away from the plan that everybody else says they will continue with? So I, I, I think the Fed is, is going to continue to plow through this. I, I think the Fed is, is not going to provide you a put. I don't think I think if you're relying on that, you, you're, you're mistaken this market, you're mistaken the Fed. But you, you do have to realize that the, 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 the cost of debt has gone up significantly already. So the Fed has done its job by talking up rates, even across the curve. I know they're not as much up, as much up out the curve as they are on the front end, but it's gotten expensive to borrow, and that's going to slow the economy. So I think you're already starting to see the impact of that. Um, I don't think the Fed has to back away for this to already be effective. So I think right now you're seeing the, the, the impact of Fed. Margins are getting hit. You're starting to see a bit of a slowdown here and there. Companies are missing earnings. I mean, that's not great. But it is the first signs of things slowing down, which should lead to inflation slowing down the, the third or fourth quarter of this year, which then enables the Fed to actually back away. So the Fed's not going to back away because the market's tough. The Fed's going to back away because inflation starts to slow later in the year. It's gotten more expensive to borrow, Matt. But in reality, a lot of companies don't have to borrow because they've got so much cash on hand. When does it actually matter that it costs so much to actually borrow money? So right now, it, 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 you, you don't have maturities that you need to roll, which is great. So you only have 2% of the investment grade market that matures in 2022, 5% matures in 2023, and 5% matures in 2024. And it's very similar in the high-yield market. So we saw Carnival come last week in the high-yield market at 10.5%. But generally, companies aren't going to be forced to come to the market to pay up. Um, but what you're going to see is them opportunistically do it. And, and so earlier in the year, it seemed like free money for corporations to borrow. So they were borrowing as much as possible. Right. That was a very negative technical. Right now, it's getting expensive. So they're just not going to borrow as much, which should improve technicals going forward, which I think will help improve total returns as well. Matt, what will happen? And I speak of Invesco here in managing old line serious money like pension funds and insurance company money. What happens to the actuarial assumption if rates move up? Does the actuarial assumption actually move higher? So the actuarial assumptions are, are based on a lot of formulas that are, are, are too, too uh, complicated for me <laughs> to, to understand or to get into on this show, certainly. But what we're seeing is that, that, that they, they can basically immunize their long-term liabilities when rates go higher. So if you want to own stocks and bonds, when bond yields go up, you actually are going to buy more right. bonds. And, and this is great for them okay. right now. And, and we're seeing a huge shift. Okay, but... I don't mean to cut you off, but this is the heart of the matter as you use the pro word immunize. If you immunize within a new higher rate environment, how do you account for the price decline that you've enjoyed in bills, notes and bonds? 
So the, the great thing of being a pension plan and insurance company is you get to close your eyes and you don't have to deal with mark-to-market accounting. <laughs> they just get the, bu- the, the book yield that they bought it at, the book price that they bought it at. And as long as they don't think there's a fundamental problem, which is a key point there, as long as there's not a fundamental credit issue, they continue to mark those bonds at where they bought them. So on, on, the, on paper, they have not lost any money thus far. And in fact, if they buy at bonds at higher yields going forward, they're, they're better off. So the retail investor takes the mark-to-market loss. The insurance company, the pension plan, does not. So they have much clearer uh, ability to, to ride right. this out, which makes it more attractive to them. Lisa, this is so important. If Frank Frabozzi was watching right now, Young Brill would have just gotten an A++. <laughs> plus plus. Well, that was what he was Matt, saying before. that's the smartest <laughs> discussion of this I've heard from anybody. That was brilliant. Well, but I will say, Matt, this really, I have a much more basic and less academic question. Have we reached peak bearishness? Is there a feeling of capitulation that has been baked in at this point? I think we have. Uh, I, think we, I think we've hit the highs for corporate credit yields from this point. I think somebody summed it up very good with me last week on the, on the call. They said, my stomach hurts to go buy a bond right now. That means it's got to be the worst time or we've got to be the, you know, the, the opportune time to start buying. Matt Brill, go away and talk to retail right now who you said is enjoying taking the losses. Matt Brill with investment. You know what I know? On radio, you're missing all the drama here. We've got winds like Hurricane Pekka from a few years ago. Straight Did you up see in what the I air. Did my hair piece? Oh. It's just... You know, I did hair care for men and the whole thing, and it just yeah. it went down in flames. I think it looks really avant-garde. On a I think break, you're doing she a pulled job. my hair and said, the glue's coming <laughs> off. I'm not that mean. Honestly, my hair's flying as well. Honestly, it's a, it's an emo- a moment uh, that is definitely memorable here in Davos. And we have a lot of incredible guests coming up to really give us a sense of the political moment. This, to me, I think uh, we've been a bit remiss, I, I given agree. the conversation yeah, I, coming I out of China yeah. with President Biden. Yeah, I, I think the politics is heard from John Kerry. I mean, you can talk to, we didn't even bring up Iran and Iraq and all the political turmoil that he faced as Secretary of State. Uh, with President Obama, but at the heart of this is the political debate that's going on right now after the primaries. Yeah, you know, right? and then it, it's something fractious. that we haven't talked about as well is what if the if the Democrats do lose the primaries, what that does to possible uh, policy well, prescription. Lose the election. Exactly. Right now we are looking at markets uh, that are losing some of the momentum from earlier as we head toward uh, the opening bell, but it does seem to be a sigh opening of bell. of of moment. Yes, it's only opening 10 bell. after eight. Yeah, that's right. That's where we are. But right now here it is what two thirty. I'm going to look at the foreign exchange market, which I do think is important, and it does. Play Play into the politics of the moment. Some EM fragilities here and there. But I really want to point out, as Winston mentioned earlier, in the Plaza Accord worry that's out there, the gloom, the doom of a true strong dollar. We're miles away from the currency targets that people are looking at. We're miles away from 135, 140 yen, miles away from a 90 or an 80 week euro as well. That'll be one thing we'll continue to monitor here in Davos. Coming up, talk about fractious politics. Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania on the Senate Banking Committee. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rosh Gupta. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia's economy should be shut off from the world and he invited global investors to ship their resources into Ukraine to help rebuild the country. In a video addressed to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Zelensky said this is the moment when it is decided where the brute force will rule the world. The White House is now walking back President Biden's comments on Taiwan in Tokyo. The president said the U.S. military would intervene to defend Taiwan in any attack from China that appeared to break the longstanding U.S. policy of so-called strategic ambiguity. The White House later said the president simply meant the U.S. would provide military equipment to Taiwan, not sending troops. And the Biden administration announced that a dozen Indo-Pacific countries will join the U.S. in a sweeping economic initiative. The goal is to counter China's influence in the region. Australia, India, Japan, South Korea and New Zealand are included, along with seven Southeast Asian countries. But the new framework doesn't include any tariff reductions, and it's unclear which parts are binding. 
Bloomberg's learned that chipmaker Broadcom is in talks to acquire cloud computing company VMware in what could be a massive deal. VMware currently has a market valuation of about $40 billion and acquisition would put Broadcom into a highly specialized area of software. Pfizer and BioNTech say their COVID vaccine was highly effective and prompted a strong immune response in children under the age of five. That's likely to pave the way for infants and toddlers to finally get immunized. The companies say that in a preliminary finding, a three-dose regimen was 80% effective in children ages six months through four years old. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Over the next year, I'm not that worried. I mean, I'm always at 15% for a recession. Maybe I'm at 20% now for the next year, but not much higher. When you look after this year, that's when I get more worried. That's when more of the Fed rate hikes start to kick in and affecting the economy. Jason Furman, Professor at Harvard Kennedy School. We welcome all of you to our windy performance here at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and the wind is going this way right now, Lisa. Oh, you want me to lean Come over? Back so I'm with fall me right over. Lisa. Oh, <laughs> here's the wind coming off uh, the mountains. You know, my wind's going straight up, left. you know? I don't know. It is. It's been, we're making it up as we go, as are all at the World Economic Forum, quite seriously. Klaus Schwab has been really wonderful and very sober about how this is different. It is a mixture of international relations and, of course, these markets uh, challenged and, of course, a war in Ukraine. And off of that, the food crisis. We barely touched on the food crisis today. Yeah, and how it's an idiosyncratic food crisis, particularly for nations that are reliant on Ukraine, particularly for nations that are running out of some of the supplies. How how do you deal with that at a time when a lot of the developed world right. is dealing with their own crises? And that really is a reluctance to spend. And that's sort of the dynamic. And the the underlying hydrocarbon input into yeah. agriculture as well. What we're going to do now is drive forward the conversation with a bent to Latin America. But we do so with the financial acuity of General Atlantic. They're a storied name in finance. Martin Escobar joins us now, their co-president. Thank you for joining us here in Windy City. Just Tom, Lisa, thank you for having me. Turn around a deck in Chicago and it'll, Love it. it'll work out. Talk I want you to talk to me how you use foreign exchange in Latin America as a litmus paper of how government systems are doing there. You are doing finance. You're doing long-term investment in Latin America, and yet it's within fragile economies with fragile foreign exchange. How do you use foreign exchange to study Latin America? That's a great question, Tom. Listen, we, we've been in Latin America. So first, to level set, GA is 42 years old, $80 billion in assets. We've been investing in technology for 40 years. We've been in the emerging markets for 20, including Latin America. And Latin America has been tough for most private equity investors because they got FX wrong. Uh, and what we've tried to do is bet on digital companies that are growing 30, 50, 60, 70 percent. So even if we get the FX wrong, we still meet the required returns. Uh, and it's really hard, easy to get the FX wrong. So we've seen a huge reset in all tech companies around the world over the past six months. Has there been the same reset, just not priced in yet, in the private world? I heard you, Tom, use the word carnage. There's been carnage in growth, public growth stocks. Right. Dropped 70 to 80%. It's been, it's, and it's been broad across good companies, great companies, and more or less companies. The private markets have not transacted as much. Right. And what, we, what we've looked at in previous corrections is it takes six to nine months before the public market comes to translate into private transactions because good companies need not trans transact in the middle of the storm. And we are in the middle of a storm, not just in Davos. So does that mean that you're extending less money, less financing at this moment in preparation for what's to come in the follow on in the private world? So interestingly, we, in the short term, we're seeing terrific opportunities in the public markets. We're not typically a public market investor. Exceptionally, we're becoming one right now. In the private markets, we are slowing down. Now, what's beginning to happen is consolidation. I mean, last year, 60,000 companies got funded. Half of them won't make it through the correction. The strong will get stronger, and the weaker will be consolidated into the strong. And so we're beginning to add capital to some of these companies uh, to consolidate their industries. Just to follow on, this is important. 
you're pulling back from the private sphere and going to public companies because of the opportunity that you see. Do you think that we are not prepared for the selling, for the lack of investment on the private side that will trickle out in the next few months? Listen, I, I, in, in the short term, the best opportunities on the public markets because there's a stampede of people coming out of the public markets. And, and the macro forces overwhelm the micro ones. There's such a mispricing of growth. And even overall, if you look at the PE to growth of the entire market, it's at 0.7. The last time it was this low was at the great financial crisis, and it was 0.8. Uh, so we're just finding better deals. Now, there's so much liquidity in the private markets, it will take a while before this phenomenon begins to affect companies, but it will. Our guess is six to nine months. Are, are you seeing within sort of a, a decades-long autocracy, and I mean that in a very loose phrase of South America, a, a greater respect and understanding for capitalization, for contract, for rule of law. Is it easier to do business now than five years ago, 10 years ago? It's a step change in a, in a number of ways. What do you mean by that? First, there's something we call the globalization of entrepreneurship. Uh, great minds are born everywhere but they don't have access to ideas and funding in the old world. In the new world, they have access to ideas and funding. Just to give you a sense of the magnitude, last year in Latin America, the growth and, and, and venture capital invested $19 billion. That's more than the previous 20 years combined. So if, you, if you're a Latin American entrepreneur- What you have was a, the catalyst to do that? Why such a ginormous number? Because we're catching up and there were enough proof points. I mean, we invested in, in a company that saw 100X uh, appreciation. It's publicly traded, twenty billion dollar company, profitable, trading at PE multiple, and and there were. Uh, on GameStop. <laughs> it's a company called XP Inc. It's it's traded in Nasdaq, and it's 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 on a real profit, not not speculative. But there's been a there's been a handful of success stories, and nothing attracts capital like proven success, and and that's what happens. So there's been a step change in access of funding to the best entrepreneurs, and economies have formalized. The electronification of payments meant you can't evade taxes anymore. And all of a sudden, 80% of, of, of companies who were formerly half informal mm. couldn't do it, and that opened it up for private investment. Does General Atlantic think that Latin America will emerge stronger or weaker from the current inflationary impulse that's allowing their exports to be that much more valuable? So listen, uh, Latin America is about 10 to 15% of what we do globally. Um, in the next three years, Brazil will benefit from the commodity cycle. It's a net exporter of commodities. The, the effects should benefit from that. that. That is a great tailwind. Mexico will benefit from nearshoring. So these two global macro tendencies will benefit the two largest economies that represent 60% of the GDP. Mm -hmm. So I think in this storm, surprisingly, Latin America is not such a risky place. Well, I got 14 more questions. Can you please visit us in New York? Anytime. If we survive the windstorms coming back. Martin Escobari, <laughs> thank you so much from General Atlantic. To me, thank you. what's so important here, and I've been guilty of this through everything I've done at Bloomberg, is Latin America's sort of over there. It's just one big misstep by me well, and too many others. First of all, there have been a series of crises, whether it's in Argentina or Venezuela or even in Brazil with what happened with the Real. So there have been so many issues that a lot of people have written the region off. Could there be un, uh, unexpected strength as a result oh. of some of the uh, of uh, the import prices going up? What do you what do you John? I got a message from John and Capri. John and Capri, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Ask Martin about Neymar and what he's going to do in Brazil soccer. Really? Yeah, mm. that's what he Yeah, he said. do we have time? We don't have time. I think we're, <laughs> luckily for our team, we're out of time on Sorry, that as John. well. We have an extremely important conversation coming up for all of you across America and frankly, uh, worldwide. He is more than Senator Pat Toomey. He is a student of his truly fractured Pennsylvania. Stunning primaries uh, in Pennsylvania is truly now a bellwether for America. Stay with us. No, it's not January. It's May. It is Bloomberg Surveillance from Davos. Bloomberg Surveillance, we welcome all of you to the meetings of the World Economic Forum. 51 years they've been doing this, but never in May. Off of January of 2020, 
couple tough years. Let's get it restarted again. And I'm unsure, at least I'm really unsure, like, do they do it then quickly in January? Or do they maybe test it and find out what people want in the summer? I think that the plan is to go to January. My guess is, is that, if they okay, take a quick poll after this, a lot of people might suggest, suggest that the summer months, very kindly suggest that the summer months yeah. may be preferable. Just say. To me, the big thing is deglobalization. It always changes through three or four days. But right now, it's that shock of the war in the total corporate system. Yeah, although Joe St uh, Stiglitz uh, of Columbia University uh, came on and he basically said he's surprised more people aren't asking mm -hmm. him about that. He's seeing the complete focus on Ukraine, on China, what's going on there, and whether additional <clears throat> series right. of lockdowns are really going to change the narrative. Right now we've got a really interesting guest. This is a gentleman who was weaned on Narragansett Lager Beer, ended up in Pennsylvania, where he did the worst job in the world, which is own a restaurant. And he survived even better, got into politics, and as a Republican, uh, held parchment from Pennsylvania. We welcome someone in the news, Senator Pat Toomey. Senator, welcome. So Thanks very much, Tom. Were you really weaned on there again? So no, it didn't beer exactly back. work <laughs> that way, uh, but I get the reference. You get, you get the reference with the Red Sox, of course. Senator, it is an immense time of tumult, and people with a little bit of change from under the bed are going into Rookie's restaurant, the old Rookie's restaurant in Allentown, and all of a sudden inflation's killing them. Yeah. That's the people of America yeah. who are getting killed. What's the Toomey solution for Republicans who take the House, maybe take the Senate, maybe take the White House? Yeah, so I think two things, right? Um, when we had the shutdown in 2020 uh, from the pandemic, um, I think it's fair to say we lost about $2 trillion of economic yep. activity. So we dug a $2 trillion hole. We filled it with $6 trillion of spending. We goosed demand way beyond where it would have been at a time when supply was constrained. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the Fed, I think, was throwing gasoline on this fire ever since the, uh, uh, the, the pandemic lockdowns mm -hmm. um, continued with emergency policy long after the emergency passed. So look, I think the Fed has gotten the joke and has made a big pivot. I think they're right. committed to see this through. And what we've got to do is stop the wild spending that's been going on. I am most certain that in the Senate of this United States, you are the most supple, dynamic mind on economic dynamics, financial dynamics, currency swaps, and derivatives. How do you explain to Republicans who have a static vision back to the 1950s <laughs> that they need to be more subtle, more dynamic to build and grow this country? Uh, I, I, I think you need to give my Republican colleagues a little more credit than that. Most of them actually weren't yet adults in the 1950s. But they're pressured by a president who desperately, a President Trump, who desperately wants to go back to another time and place. I think he wants to invent a new time altogether, President Trump. I mean, and, and he's not the president now, and I, I think the party should not take economic advice from him as long as we acknowledge there were some tremendous successes. I think the tax reform was extremely pro-growth, very constructive, gave us really the best economy of my lifetime before the pandemic hit. Um, but I think the president's been dead wrong on trade from the beginning. So, so it's a mixed bag there. I, as I say, I don't look to him. I don't think most of my colleagues do. Um, we, uh, I think we have a better so grounding. Yeah. You said you think he's dead wrong on trade. Do you yeah. agree then with President Biden that they should possibly remove some of the tariffs on China? The, the, prob under Biden? the problem is no, pres Trump. President Biden has been a complete extension of the Trump administration in trade. Consider the only free trade agreement under Trump was to renegotiate NAFTA in a way that would diminish trade. We've never done that before. And President Biden, not a single free trade negotiation underway now a year and a half into his administration. Uh, he hasn't lifted all the 232 tariffs. He's resisting a uh, corporate exemption process on 301 tariffs. So, no, I think the Biden administration has been an extension of the Trump administration on trade. Do you think that your Republican colleagues would agree with you that some of these Trump era tariffs should be removed? Uh, I, I think some do and some don't, right? So this has become a, div a divisive issue among Republicans when there used to be a very broad Republican consensus that was pro-trade, expanding trade, free trade agreements. That's, that's diminished in, in all candor. Um, and we've got, we've got friction on the other side too, right? Previously, Democratic presidents, whether it was Barack Obama or Bill Clinton, were pro-trade. Um, 
we've lost that now, and so we've really lost the pro-trade okay. consensus. So you go out, you take the Pennsylvania train, you go out, there's that road turn near Altoona where the road turns 360 degrees around, the train track goes around, yeah, around. and you end up in Latrobe and you're having a rolling rock at a bar. Yeah. Explain to the people pounding rolling rocks at that bar how the new Republican Party is going to make them prosper with foreign trade. Well, I, I would point out, so the best economy in their lifetime was also the best in mine, which was 2019. Record low unemployment, strong growth, low inflation, uh, diminishing income gap between high income and lower income people. It was really, it's really hard to find anything not to like about where the economy was. That was in response to Republican policies. It's true, President Trump was pushing back on trade, but he had hardly moved the needle in a substantive sense, right? We still have roughly the freest trading environment in 100 years. That guy at the bar with me in Latrobe, his wages were going up faster than inflation. That's not a bad place to be. How do you break inflation then? Right now, the Integrin, he's the only guy I can talk to from Washington who'll get this. On the x-axis, the Integrin of a negative real wage, we haven't seen in ages. The thickness right. of our negative real oh. wage is frightening. Yeah, yeah. What is the Toomey prescription? So the, the, it's, the Fed's got to do its job. It's got to stay this course. With negative real interest rates as negative as they are, I don't think we get there, but the market is doing a lot to help, right? The, the backup in the bond market, the strength of the dollar in the currency markets, all of that is at least disinflationary, if not deflationary. Meanwhile, we've started to see um, slight declines in consumer purchases, right? Our big retailers have seen, they've kept nominal growth, but not real growth. So that tells me there's demand well, destruction. We do this. Should we break the rules for, for the Senator? Well, I, think yeah, I think we should. Is the Fed going to blink? I don't think so. Okay, well, this is I don't what I wanted so. to ask. Do you think that it's worth it for the Fed to not blink, to it, keep going, the, even if it means a recession? The Fed has to stay the course here. Even right? if it means recession? Even if it means a recession. The Fed blew this badly. They, they had a paradigm that guaranteed that they would be behind the curve, and they were. Now they get it. I don't think this Fed wants to be the Fed that brings back enormously problematic inflation. For How much do your colleagues agree with you? Because we heard Joe Biden saying that a recession is not inevitable, maybe not inevitable. Do, but do people in Washington agree that right now it's preferable to have a recession than to allow prices so, to continue to climb at this pace? So that's if if it has to be, right? That That's that's my, first of all, I don't think a uh, recession is inevitable. I'd say it's probably a little more likely than not. It could be mild, it could be brief. Unemployment could rise very modestly from really quite low levels that they're at now. But we never get back to really strong growth and really good opportunity unless we get stability in the dollar. We're not there right now. That's got to be exercise number one for our medium and long-term prosperity. Do you think that the banks, with the financial banking sector really under your peer view, are prepared for a Fed that is not going to blink, as so many people seem to believe. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, as you know, there's a rising interest rate environment is actually helpful for a lot of banks. Uh, so I'm not sure which ones you're referring to. Obviously, those that are based more on securities trading, you know, they, they it's hard to say, right? They may, they may do well for volume purposes. Uh, they'll take their lumps in other ways. But look, that, that can't be the consideration. We've got to get back to normalizing interest rates, normalizing the inflation uh, level, and then we can have strong growth again. Andrew Carnegie built a, a, a school building at Carnegie Mellon, and he built it with a, a slanted floor so that if it failed, if Carnegie Mellon University failed, he could turn it into a factory. That was the entrepreneurial spirit of Pittsburgh of long, long ago and far away. You and I lived the 74, 75 crater that yeah. was Pittsburgh. Yeah. Do we need to fear that? Do we need some humility still about manufacturing in America, or have we now become service sector so much? So I, you know this very well, but I do think it's worth repeating. America manufa will, will manufacture more this year than any year in our history. More added value in manufacturing. It happens in different, uh, with different products. It's less labor intensive, but we are a great manufacturing powerhouse. We will retain that in my, in my view. And P Pittsburgh's doing great. <laughs> Senator, actually. before we let you go, yeah. who do you hope replaces you in the Senate? Um, you know, either one of these guys, uh, I, I'd never made an endorsement. No, seriously. <laughs> Give them another there, rolling there, rock. There's, there's two great candidates. They are dead tied. I think this ends within a few hundred votes, literally. And either one wins the election in the fall.
spoken like a true politician. No, we have really good <laughs> candidates. Is it going to be a fair recount? It is, and to the credit of both candidates, they have taken the view that it's probably a good idea to actually count all the How votes. How many citizens are involved in the recount of some? These people nationwide are being abused. My mother was an election canvasser, whatever it was called. How many people are involved in that recount? I don't know the number, but let me just tell you, I think some of our great heroes have been the people that did their job of whatever party, counted right. the votes, and went right. with the outcome they got. Right. That's how the system's supposed to work. That's how it worked Good. in 2020, and it'll work that way in Senator, 2022. Senator, thank you. When you're done with politics, fix the pirates. <laughs> Pat Toomey is the senator from thank Pennsylvania. You, thank you. We're going to come back here. We've got lots more uh, to talk about here. And I, you know, I think within the politics there, really the one thing we've ignored is the war in Ukraine. It has been, I'm doing a panel on Thursday with Sir Lawrence Friedman, among others, on this horrific war. It's hard to quantify the grasp for some sort of democratic uh, excellence. And I think that that seems to be the way that it's being painted. This idea of trying to extol uh, a democracy rather than a sort of authoritarian dictatorship, which is basically how this is being framed right now in markets. That has been the focus, the tumult yeah. and the difficulty with inflation that is actually forcing the central banks to tighten to the point of possibly crimping growth to the downturn. Well, we will see, and that will be part of the this worry about recession here at Davos, and of course, we'll continue to look at the markets uh, as well. Right now, what I would, well, more than anything, the five basis point back up, 10 year yield, 2.83%. That's enough for Pat Toomey to finance a world champion Pittsburgh Pirates. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rosie Gupta. President Biden says he'll review Trump-era tariffs imposed on imports from China that led to a rally in the offshore yuan. The Biden administration has maintained most of the tariffs imposed by his predecessor, but the president has come under pressure from some lawmakers and economists and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to reduce or eliminate them. President Biden is seeking to reassure Americans about the current monkeypox outbreak at a news conference in Tokyo. The president said it was unlikely to cause a pandemic on the scale of the coronavirus. He said the U.S. has enough smallpox vaccine stockpiled to deal with the outbreak. Beijing has reported a record number of new COVID cases for its current outbreak. That is reviving concerns that China's capital could face a broad lockdown as authorities try to stamp out the spread of the virus. China's COVID zero approach has become increasingly controversial, leaving the country isolated from the rest of the world. And in New York, police are searching for a man who shot and killed a Goldman Sachs employee on a subway train. Daniel Enriquez was 48 and had worked for Goldman since 2013. Goldman calls the death a senseless tragedy. An increase in assaults on New York's subway system has prompted Mayor Eric Adams to boost the number of officers on patrol. JP Morgan Chase says its net interest income this year should rise 26% to more than $56 billion. That is $3 billion more than the previous estimate. JP Morgan's top execs are set to kick off a high stakes investor day. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. interest rates is not going to solve the problem of inflation. We can do a lot more mm -hmm. than we're doing. Uh, can you Killing the economy through raising interest rates is not going to be a okay. solution at any time frame. So at least trying to do everything we can right. globally to increase the supply is going to do more. I said he was the most important person in this valley. That's because people here are in shell shock over the new Globalization, the word that's popping around is deglobalization. I'm not sure about it, but Joe Stiglitz is the one, whether you love him or hate him, who got this debate going. The gentleman from Gary, Indiana, won't let up, will No, he won't let up, although he does see some benefits to trade and looks to shore up some of those elements 
to avoid some of the inflationary spiral rather than the Fed. Pat right. Toomey of the Senate just coming on, the U.S. Senate, saying the exact opposite. The Fed needs to get this under control and that the Fed put is not going to come into play right. until we do that. We welcome all of you here to Davos. It is a windswept Davos. Lisa and I perhaps will land in Oz here uh, <laughs> Tuesday or Wednesday. The market's quiescent. Uh, certainly better than the sh shock and the panic yeah. that we saw last week. We've been doing a lot on politics in international American politics, and we drive that for, uh, forward with Ed Mills joining us now, Washington policy analyst at Raymond James. Ed Mills, we just had on the retiring senator from Pennsylvania, Pat Toomey. You suggested on the break that he is a lonely senator, critical a former President Trump's trade uh, strategy, and also critical that President Biden hasn't turned it around. You suggest there's a lot of people that like our present trade strategy. Yeah, Tom, I think if you were to poll all 435 members of Congress, um, you know, there'd probably only be a handful of Pat Toomey's out there. Um, you highlighted uh, at the beginning the adjective you used was retiring Senator Pat Toomey. Um, it's because he is no longer kind of necessarily within the middle of his party. Um, and what you've seen on the Hill through the Trump years is the most perilous position was to be in favor of China. Part of the reason why Biden has not removed those tariffs, have kept most of the Trump policies in place, is that you don't want anyone on the kind of, you know, easy on China side uh, to blast you. And so the most bipartisan thing in D.C. right now is getting tough on China. And I think that's exactly why Biden, in his comments this morning, uh, highlighted uh, military support potentially for Taiwan. Is free trade dead? Um, you know, I think it's not dead, but it's different. Um, we are right now, instead of having a conversation about the globalization, as you highlighted, a deglobalization. We are more focused on supply chains versus on free trade. Uh, the president is in Asia talking about this new uh, pan-Indonesian uh, kind of uh, partnership. They are clearly not calling it, it's an economic uh, commitment, not a free trade agreement. You cannot get a free trade agreement passed through a Democratic Congress, and it's very difficult to get it done uh, through a Republican Congress. So uh, free trade is um, a bit of a four-letter word in D.C. right now, and I think that's why we see what the president is doing is not pursuing a free trade agreement, but other economic discussions. To that point, Ed, this morning's comments from President Biden were notable. First of all, they've already been walked back with respect to uh, the U.S. providing military support in some sort of concrete on the ground way to Taiwan. They've walked that back, sticking with tradition. But people are really honing in on this idea of removing tariffs uh, on Chinese goods by the U.S. that were implemented <clears throat> under Trump. Do you think that that will fly, given the sentiment that you just put out there? Yeah, Lisa, I think I always go back to what is the definition of a gaffe? Um, it's telling the truth in D.C. Um, and so, while they might be walked back. I do think that the president really wants to send a message to China that there would be a significant price to pay uh, if they were to attempt to invade Taiwan. I think the assessment that I get from almost any person that I talk to in and around the Biden administration is that they do not anticipate that that's something that's close, but they want to send a message of strength. Uh, they do think that the invasion of Ukraine and how poorly that's gone for Russia and how much the world's been unified uh, is a warning sign uh, to China, but they want to ramp it up one more level. Um, and so I think that's where kind of the Biden administration is focused on. Um, versus kind of trying to kind of send any sort of kind of conciliatory right. message that we have seen in the past. Ed Mills, thank you so much for the Raymond James here and something surprising here that we're spending so much time, you know, with the president in China and all that. But the disconnect, Lisa, between an international relations discussion of what's next within the history of free trade in America 
and the reality that Mr. Mills paints I think is you're right. stunning. I think that that's a very wow. correct way to bring that up. Basically, free trade doesn't sell in the American population right now. It is political death in the water if you start to argue for free trade. And that is the reason why President Biden has picked up on President Trump's trade policy. So then how do you really free up some of the momentum right. between countries where you get some of the, uh, the connections that people are talking it, about here? It, Am I wrong to say what's needed is someone courageous and that we need someone on either party to take a stand and risk losing uh, an election? I'm not going to argue have, one side or another. This? I think that it shows how a, a right. lot of the, uh, the, the elite in some of the academic thought has shifted away from the population in terms of what they would like mm -hmm. to see. And so how do you bring it back? I think that is a question. Uh, it's just some sort of balance between the two. We're getting an international claim to the wind here. I mean, <laughs> you actually look really, I got to admit, you look really put together here. Because so, you did seven miles today. I mean, I didn't know the band, but <laughs> I ran, I ran so okay. far away. Right. <laughs> I just ran, I ran all night and day. This I ran, I couldn't think. get away. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. It could have been the sound of music. Instead, it was flock of seagulls. Flock of seagulls in Switzerland. That works. That why don't you take us out? I gotta, I gotta Honestly, work on my hair. We're looking right now. At on radio, you're lucky. Com. Yes, indeed. Although they are oh, no. sing. Oh no! Oh no! We just lost something due to the wind. Uh, I will say, in markets, it's a little calmer than it is here on set. The bottle of tang <laughs> broke. Um, I will say, we are seeing reprieve after the longest streak of losses going back to 2001. Nice data check. Feral could have done that. This is Bloomberg.